Hello and welcome to Shoot the Breeze, where we take a nostalgic look at a random football magazine from the past. I'm Andy Smith, aka Scotch Footy Cards on Twitter, and with me is Tom Brogan. Hello. In each episode, we'll invite a special guest to join us in trawling through the magazine and discuss anything contained within it. This could be anything from an article, to a photograph, to a competition, to an advert. Basically, if it's in it, then we'll talk about it. So sit back and let's shoot the breeze. Wriggles clear, might just get the chip and he does, he's scored! Oh, oh what a great goal. backlash! He did it! Oh, brilliant play! Wriggling his way, that's an excellent ball that he needs! It's a goal, four for Clyde back, excellent play by Hughes, I think the player of the match and sweetly finished by Kenny. And this week our guest is James Dixon. Uh, James is a writer and former podcast host. Uh, he hosted the NFL podcast Tuesday Morning Football. He's written for The Guardian and Gridiron Magazine. And he's also written his first book, The Fix, How the First Champions League Was Won and Why We All Lost. Thanks very much for coming on, James. No worries. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, thank you very much for joining us. So for yourself, we picked out a shoot magazine from the 3rd of April, 1993. So as we do, we shall start from the front cover. And the front cover has photos of Ian Wright in action for Arsenal, Teddy Sheringham for Spurs, Dave McPherson for Rangers against Marseille, and a photo of Danny Wilson of Sheffield Wednesday tussling with who I think is Dave Whitehouse of Sheffield United. I'm not quite sure if anybody knows any better than that. Um, there's a picture of the FA Cup, which is shown at the bottom of the page. It's a mag- magazine previews the Arsenal versus Spurs in the Sheffield Derby in the two semi-finals of the FA Cup. At the top of the page, it says semi-final special. Plus, we have a title verdict as the season nears the end. Cantona with a full page colour photo of the Man United man, and there's an Inter Milan team group poster inside. Now, for the Dave McPherson photo, the accompanying text with it says, it's winner bus for Rangers as they face Marseille in the European Cup. Now, that, for me, there are signs that the strips were starting to get a bit oversized and a bit less shape to them at this period. There's still some classic sh- kits throughout the magazine, but I just think the design quality is beginning to draw. And, and I know there's going to be a lot of people from this sort of era who think they're classics, but for me, they just started getting too big the designs were a bit rubbish, so there's a couple I'm going to pick out inside as well. Uh, it's a cover price of 65 pence, and it's worth noting that the exclamation mark at the end of shoot has been dropped in the header. Uh, so, And also the second O of the shoot is now a tangle football. Uh, we obviously, we, we looked through shoot magazines from 1969 onwards, and back in 1969, the shoot logo or the shoot title at the front there also had a football on it as well, so it wasn't something new, but... You know, I think you'll agree, Tom, that not all of them, the ones we've looked at, I don't know, maybe it's something you've never really thought about. But certainly the, the exclamation mark is a big thing for me with shoot. It's like even if I'm writing about shoot in this place, I'll always put an exclamation mark because it's always, that's always the way it is. Um, so anything we want to pick out from the front cover? Anything we want to talk about? I mean, f- for me, you know, the front cover... I- I focus in on the on on the Rangers Marseille because that that that's what particularly inter- interests me. Um, I think it's really interesting if, you, if you're talking about the kits, you actually see two different iterations of Adidas kits there. Um, the, but the, you know Rangers and Marseille mm. both this season are sponsored by Adidas, but Rangers have the the free stripes across the both shoulders, whereas Marseille have arguably the more iconic uh, uh, across just the just the right shoulder, yep. which I think is a bit of a nicer look and. Um, Technically, it wasn't win or bust for Rangers. It was, uh, uh, yeah, but we can come on to that later. Yeah, Tom, anything you want to? Uh, um, not particularly. Just looking at the Sheffield uh, derby there, the pictures, just again, you're talking about how everything's big. Just know the two two crests are quite big uh, on the shirts, and they're both, are, are, are they, they're both wearing their home kits there in white stripe and blue and white stripes. I don't know if that's. Although Sheffield Wednesday have got black shorts and blue socks, yeah. and uh, Sheffield United have got white and white. Uh, I just don't know. Do they still play in their home kits? I don't know. Red, red and white and blue and white. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. Do you, do you know, Tall James? Uh, it's been a while since I've mm. watched a Sheffield derby. To, to, yeah. to, to be honest, I definitely remember because they played. Um, they obviously the semi. 
they do wear these these kits in that semi final. It yeah. is it is home versus home for for the for, for the Wembley match, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I think more more of the it doesn't really matter, does it? Um, with kits, it's like they, they, there's, there seems to be no rhyme or reason to at times. You know what kit they wear. You see some games where they're both wearing their away kits, and it's like, what, why is that? A lot of it comes from. From from referees and linesmen, and, and perhaps they have a little bit too much power. But you know, there's there's um like for, for example, they, we're, we're doing this a week after the Euro final. I mean, could could did England need to play in all white? Couldn't we have had the blue shorts? Mm-hmm. Couldn't Italy have had the white? You know, uh, the white shorts rather than the dark blue. It, it, it's I know linesmen and referee like to have a clear distinction between light and dark to make mm-hmm. so they can make their decisions easier. Uh, how many of them do they have a game versus the the aesthetic beauty of just seeing you know teams as they're supposed to be? Yeah, no, I agree with that, and I think also, you know, as much as you know, this this is a a, a right talking point, but you know they've got VAR for the little decisions where they, where they get it wrong, um, you would hope. But um, yeah, I'm I'm not a fan. I think in the tournament there, there was there was a period that you just thought every single team was going to come out with a single colour kit, you know, at mm. the beginning of it. So not for me, not for me. Okay, but we'll jump inside. So we're on to page two and we're straight into a full colour photo of Jose Maria Baquero of Barcelona in Spain. And he's pictured in his Barcelona kit battling for the ball against two opposition players. Um, I, anyone know the, the opposition team they're up against there? That looks like Madrid to me. Um, mm. With the, yeah. the Teca, you can see you can see That's almost right. the start of that Teca sponsorship. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they sponsored other people as well, but that, that is a, a full white kit. And an exceptional moustache on the whoever whoever's tracking him. Yeah. I couldn't tell you who it was though, but yeah. that is a quality moustache and mullet combination. Yeah, I think when you've said Real Madrid there, the the guy the lad in the right looks a bit familiar actually. No, no, I look at him again. I'm trying to think of what what who he was, but the Barcelona kit is a Kappa kit, and there's no sponsor on it, which they famously had for for quite a long time, and it's got a Kappa band down the arms, and for me that's a good looking kit. Again, it's a bit big. But it's a good-looking Barcelona kit for me. Um, now, Baquero played for Real Sociedad between 1980 and 1988 before moving to Barca, where he'd stay until 1996. And he was capped 30 times for the Spanish national team. Anybody have any recollections of Jose Maria Baquero? He, he was he was a, a great player, a very a very creative midfielder, and uh, very important to Cruyff's original dream team. Uh, played very well in the the ninety two European Cup final that was at Wembley against, against Sampdoria, mm-hmm. um, where they famously put this kit back on because going back to our previous conversation, they were made to play the, one of the biggest game in their history in an awful orange. Yeah. terrible change kit uh, and so because it was the first time they won the european cup for all the photos they uh, all the players put this kit back on all right and so after the game they, they went back into their normal kit? yeah if you if you go back you see it they've, they're wearing this kit but they've obviously they've still kept the orange shorts it yeah. looks very very strange <laughs> yeah. um but yeah it's it's worth digging out that's a, that's a yeah. good, good i mean i, I kind of don't like that i mean i, I kind of think you're a wee kit should I mean something to you as well you know, rather than these kind of random colours kind of thing. Obviously... I mean, I think I think the orange means a lot in Catalonia. It's just nowhere near as iconic as right. the as 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 as, as the uh, you know as, as the red and blue. Or, or I think the the red is technically called vermilion. Um, they're not red. They're more than a club. Of course, they can't have red. <laughs> so uh, yeah. yeah, but yeah, yeah. I think it means something. It it just was in 1992. It was just a horrible iteration of it. Mm. Okay, across the page on page three, so this is another change to the format of the magazine that we'd be used to, and there's actually a contents page, which earlier magazines didn't have. As a subtitle, it reads, it's the only soccer mag that talks to the stars. Now, I, I would probably win that challenge in court that that's been the case. So I, I don't know why they're saying that. Um, but there's, there's an editorial, and it's from Mark Irwin, and he gives his views that the semi-finals of the FA Cup has been devalued this year by the decision to play them both at Wembley, saying that the trips there should be for the final only. There's also a subscription uh, hotline telephone number that you can phone where all major credit cards are accepted, so presumably you would get these through the post. So, I, I, you know, for me, um, it's I, I agree with it. Uh, I, I think that you know the the finals of any country, whether it be a Hamden, whether it be Wembley. You know it should just be for the finals. But 
realistically, they've got to get their use out of the stadiums, haven't they? I mean, I certainly think that's what they what, what they do now. But I, this one, from what I remember, was um, it's this was the second time that it had been played at Wembley. The first time was ninety one. Uh, it was Arsenal Spurs again, and that's the famous Gaza goal, mm. for the, the free kick. Um, um, they obviously then go on to the final, and he injures himself by being a lunatic. Um, and then so. Arsenal, they'd, almost, they'd already set a sort of precedent for Arsenal Spurs to be to be at Wembley. Um, and then the other side of the draw is this big Sheffield derby. And the clubs, the two Sheffield clubs themselves, asked for the game to be at Wembley because they wanted to get more money out of it. Yeah. Um, so as much as we probably want to have a go at the FA... Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's driven by it's driven by the clubs and their greed in this in this instance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I don't think I'm overly precious about the idea. Um, I, I think players want to play there, mm. uh, fans want to go there. So you know, as so you know, as much as I would have preferred it not to be like semi finals, you know, it's like if that is, it's not going to, it's not really going to make a big difference to me. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to pages four and five. There's quite a few things in here. So this is over the top, and it's two pages of small stories, some accompanied by photographs, and there's some, or at least one with a graphic as well. So we're just going to, I'm, I'm going to pick a few out, and then we'll see if there's anything that I've missed that anybody wants to talk about. The first one I'm going to look at is a palace snub for Strachan. The article says, poor old Gavin Strachan missed out when the family went to Buckingham Palace the other day to receive Dad's OBE from the Queen. Palace regulations limit the number of guests to three, and Gordon took his wife Leslie, his son Craig, and his daughter Gemma. Gavin had to wait outside in the car. And Strachan said, this is for the whole family and the people of Leeds. Mind you, this will definitely be the only medal I win this year. And the article is accompanied by a photo from the big day showing Gordon with his OBE medal, and Gavin and Craig on either side, and they're suitably attired in a suit, tails, and top hats, grey top hats with a, a black band around it. For me, it's it's, it's typical Gordon Strack and everything in this article, you know, from, from making his oldest son stay out in the car outside Buckingham Palace. And I, I'm sure it wasn't just like parked outside either um, to, you know, talking about how it's going to be the only medal that he wins this year. But it's, it's a lovely wee story that. I mean, I, ju- I just love Gordon Strack and yeah. he's, he's just got a, He's just got a wit and a self-deprecation about him that is just, you know, makes him, you know, a, a very interesting, uh, you know, former footballer to me. And you know, for, you know, you know, he's right. Leeds were their title defence was abysmal. They were knocked out. Obviously, you know, they were knocked out of the European Cup Champions League by Rangers. Um, you know, he's yeah, but he. He got he dragged them to that title the year before, so yeah, yeah very pleased. I didn't know he had an OBE, so now that I do, I'm pleased for him. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that uh, that documentary uh, on that uh, Leeds team. Um, but there's a, there's a lovely wee bit in it where Strachan's talking about all the fans that have come up to him and asked him for a selfie over the years, and and he says I I never thought, but I should have got a selfie with him so that I would have had all the pictures with all these fans. I just thought it was that was a really mm. nice feeling. Yes, a great way of looking at it. Uh, I've never thought about that. Okay, we'll move on to the next one, which is Halifax boss Mike Rathbone has fined himself for calling his players a load of rubbish after a 2-0 defeat to Carlisle. He's also agreed to wash their cars and scrub out the toilets at the ground. What do we say to that? I, I, I think, he, you know, he's um, he's losing the dressing room. You know, the old, the old cliche here. He's losing the dressing room with that sort of behaviour for me. You know, um, what do we think? I'm 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 all for it. It was uh, uh yeah, it's uh, didn't didn't prick my consciousness at the time of uh, of the Halifax boss cleaning cl- uh, cleaning out the toilets at the Shea. But you know why not? Uh, it sort of reminds me of um, Ferguson after Aberdeen won the won the mm. Scottish Cup and uh, and calling out his players on the pitch and saying how that how they were rubbish even though they'd just beaten Rangers I think um and and, and talking of documentaries the, the Ferguson documentary he he regrets that you can tell that he 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 th- he knows that he he it's just something you shouldn't do as a manager is you know you, you know that's for that's for the sanctity of the dressing room isn't it yeah yeah it's typ- typical Fergie as well you know it's like he just wants more and more and more but yeah, you're right. I mean, to to win the cup final against Rangers and say, 
we should be playing better. It's like just take the win, take the win. Okay, on to the next one, seeing double. Now this one is a bit cringy. Um, now shoot, pick out Millwall striker Malcolm Allen and country singer KD Lang as lookalikes. They start off by saying, we are not sure who this is going to offend more, before going on to say, not only is Miss Lang a female, she's also rather good friends, in quotes, with Martina Navratilova. I think we found the answer to who's going to get, um, you know, who's going to be a bit more offended by that. It's it's crass, isn't it? It's, it's, it's not good. No, it's Martina Navratilova. She should be the one who's most offended by this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's typical of the, the era as well. And, you know, with the, certainly not excusing it, but it's, it does make you cringe when you see things like this. Um, okay, moving on to the next one. And we're on safety blades. This is Sheffield United boss Dave Bassett has sent all his players on a first aid and life saving course following the recent injury to Rotherham United player John Buckley, which left him on a life support machine for several days with a fractured skull and a blood clot on the brain. Luckily, Buckley is out of danger and on the road to recovery, though his playing future must now be in doubt. So I looked a bit, looked up John a bit more. He's a Scot from East Kilbride, and they received the injury in the game against Plymouth Argyle and decided to retire from the game uh, after recovering. He did make a return to playing for the North East Counties League, in the North East Counties League, before being knocked unconscious in a game for Hatfield, Maine in 1995. So as you can imagine, he then gave up permanently after that. He started at Celtic in 1982 and he'd lay on the goal that John Sludden scored in the Glasgow Cup against Rangers where they would win 2-1. So we, we've spoke about that before on this podcast, haven't we Tom, where John Sludden's only appearance was the, the Glasgow Cup game for Celtic against Rangers and they scored and they won, which is not a bad, you know, if you're going to have a single appearance for Celtic, then that's a not a bad um, little way to do it. So he's, um, John Buckley's only appearance for the first team for Celtic came in a 4-1 League Cup win over a broth. He then played at Partick Thistle, moved south to Doncaster Rovers and then on to Leeds United for a spell. He moved to Rotherham for his first spell there and moved back to Partick Thistle in 1990-91 and then had a spell at Scunthorpe before moving back to Rotherham where he would only play four games before this injury. So I mean this this is this is quite pertinent given the, the Christian Eriksen um mm. thing that happened during the, the the Euros there. It's um you know, for me, it sh- it should be things like that should be done at school level and at, you know, all club level. Is there's there's no reason that we, as a society we shouldn't be learning these things. Absolutely, and you've you've got to you know you've got to think as well. Um you know as I say, at all levels, this can come in, you know, we have in any other line of work, you'll have first aiders, mm. you know, you know, of course there's medical staff at the big, at big games, but you know, when you're training at a lower level, you know, it'd be, it'd be so good if, if, you know, if players had basic, if basic first aid and, you know, perhaps it's my view of Dave, but, but you know, Dave Bassett just, you know, gone up in my estimation and you know, someone, you know, it's not one of the people that you think as a sort of, you know, forward thinking yeah. manager, you'd thought of him as sort of very old school, but you know, nothing, nothing to criticize here. This is a great initiative. Mm-hmm. And I, when I first read it, I just sort of assumed that it was in a game they were playing at, which because it wasn't, that sort of makes it a bit, you know, a bit more impressive as well. It's like it was yeah. a completely unrelated game and they saw from that and says, listen, we need to, we need to be ready just in case something like this happens for us. So, yeah, absolutely. Well done, Dave Bassett, and that. Uh, next one is Robson's in for Barnes. So this story touches on the possibility that Bobby Robson could be looking to take Liverpool's John Barnes to Sporting Lisbon. His contract expires in the summer, and manager Graham Souness is said to be keen to extend his stay at the club. Now, should say it's unlikely that Barnes will agree to a new deal. As a spoiler, Barnes agreed to a new deal, and he was there for another four years. Um, now I, I, I think I know there was um, some friction between Sunis. Well, you can put another any other name after that, but there was friction between Sunis and Barnes at the time. But um, yeah, what's our memories of John Barnes around about this time, or at any point in his career? I guess around about this time, John Barnes is about three weeks away from scoring uh, one of the the best goal. You know, outside of the Maracanã goal, one of the best goals of his England career. A, 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 
a free kick against Holland, uh, which was basically the last good thing he really did for the national team. I remember him sort of shifting inside. He, he was no longer a winger really for Liverpool. Mm-hmm. He was more playing centre mid, um, looking obviously a little bit bigger than, than previous, but still an absolute quality player on the ball, wasn't he? Yeah. What's your memories, Tom? Yeah, no, I know. I remember him as being a, a delight to watch. Mm. Um, it was just a shame when he came up to Celtic. He wasn't. He wasn't for playing. Yeah, because I, I would love to. Have, I would love to have seen him uh, a year in, in Scotland when he was when he could have done something. Mm. I think it's quite lucky for Barnes that he didn't go to a sport in Lisbon because Robson moves on very quickly from sport in Lisbon um, after 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 the next season and, get, and, and goes to Porto. So if he was going to reconnect with Bobby Robson, that wouldn't have lasted too long. Yeah. Okay, so I'm I'm going to for the probably I think in this last podcast I did this well. I'm going to look at a cartoon, which for me normally mm. I skip the cartoons, James, because. I don't normally find them funny, but I like this one, so we're going to have a look at this one. Now, this this is by Tony Husband, and it's worth picking out. And so, this cartoon, there's a fan at the side of the pitch who's shouting abuse at the referee in the first two drawings. And the last drawing, the ref goes up to the offending fan and says, Look, son, can we talk about this when we get home? To which the fan replies, Yeah, sure, Dad. Which I, I quite like that. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's not rip-roaringly funny, but from the context of other ones that have been in the magazine, I quite like that. Um, and speaking of Tony Husband, have you have you got your calendar up on the wall, Tom? Uh, it's it's um, oh, it's here actually. Yeah. What's um, one yeah? So, it, so so just for a bit of background with that, just um, one of the nights on Twitter, I can't remember something to do with Jared Kutchner or something like that, and I, I I retweet, I sent a tweet to Tony Husband about it, and he, and he ended up doing a drawing. And he says, if you send me your address, I'll, I'll send this drawing to you. And I laugh, well, brilliant, thank you. And as a result of that, we also bought a couple of the calendars, which were for, I think, the Dementia. Well, the Exeter Dementia Action Alliance. Yeah. So that, that's, that was a great wee thing for him to do. And it means that I've got a nice wee drawing that he's signed that I can frame and pretend that, you know, I, I know famous people. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, I, I, did... Did other people find it slightly amusing, or just got a wee sort of hmm? Did we get a hmm out of it? Yeah, you got a hmm. Yeah, good. It's good. nice. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. Often, Seven out of ten. I often say that that, that, that when um, you know people type lol, that this is what they actually do. Hmm. <laughs> it's like there's never a lol in there. There's never a lol. So we're all lying about that. Okay, moving on to the uh, McGrath, the best ever. This is. Yeah, um, Paddy Crerand, I think must have must have had a few shandies when he, when he came up with this one. Not that I'm saying he, he's wrong, but I think he's over the top. So former Man United winner, title winner, Paddy Crerand is quite gushing about Aston Villa's Paul McGrath. He says McGrath is the best cent- central, uh, the best centre half I have ever seen, anywhere, any time. I have played with and against some great defenders and seen plenty of others, but McGrath tops a lot. To simply call him Europe's greatest is an understatement and doesn't do him justice. I mean, I've said it before, McGrath was absolutely brilliant, a quality, quality defender. Um, but I think Paddy's just taking it a little bit too far. I mean, potentially, but you know, this is this is the season that uh, McGrath wins uh, the Player of the Year, mm. or either Players Player of the Year or Football Writers. I can't remember. So he's he's in a he's certainly in a a sort of rich vein of form. Yeah. Um, I know Villa fans who 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 will swear hands down that this statement is true. Yeah. Who you know he had a couple of years there where he sort of got on top of his demons with alcohol and, and was playing well for Ireland, obviously at the World Cup and, and and doing well for Villa. And you know they say he was sort of untouchable at that time. Yeah. Um, I do you know I would probably put Baresi, Maldini. You know a few, a, a few a few a few others up there, but he, he's. I think you'd say he's in the conversation. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a, it's a good good point. That. What about for you, Tom McGrath? Paul McGrath. Yeah, I I loved him, and I I love watching him speak. Now I was I was watching him on uh, Tommy Tiernan's chat show. Uh, it was a great wee interview with him, and of course not um, finding Jack Charlton documentary. Hmm. Um, he's 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 great in that. Uh, I. 
Okay, so the next one I'm going to move on to is the money's on money. So Celtic fans are clearly none too impressed with the strike rate of Stuart Slater since his £1 million move from West Ham. Glasgow bookies report a roaring trade that Slater will finish the season with less goals than Samirin goalkeeper Campbell Money, who has scored two penalties this season. So just as a wee spoiler, he didn't finish with less than two goals. <laughs> he, ma- he managed three goals that season, so he managed to... And I did check if Cam- Campbell Money scored any more as well, and he hadn't. So, um, I mean, that's, that's a, you know, it's a wee bit of fun, I suppose. But um, the thing is, uh, Celtic, a few Celtic fans I know, you know, just think Stuart Slater maybe was there at the wrong time. He was the right player at the wrong time. But, they, you know, they liked him as a player. They thought he was quite classy. So, you know, we spoke about this before, where, where just sometimes players are at the wrong club or at the wrong time, you know, and then they go to somewhere else and they suddenly become, you know, world beaters in quotes sort of thing. Next one, uh, Kevin Keegan going transfer mad. This story tells of how Kevin Keegan got his sidekick, Terry McDermott, to pretend to be a manager after one of his players the previous year to keep him in practice following a slow time in the transfer market. Keegan said, it was the only chance I got to do a bit of wheeling and dealing. So he got him to phone up, got him to phone him up and ask about his his players, can they? You know, it's just it's it's it's. I, I don't know how that works really. I don't know how you say no. Uh, yeah, it's. I, I'm speechless for it. Actually, you know, it just sounds like a wee bit of a waste of a time. I, I don't know what you're going to learn from that. I, th- I think Keegan's such an interesting character. Um, if you go back, you know, like to to he grew up relatively close to where I live. And one one day he just decides to run from Doncaster to Nottingham to see whether he could. And that's more than a marrow. He's just, there's something, and he's obviously, there's something just not quite the same as everyone else is about Kevin Keegan, you yeah. know, the way that, the way that he thinks about football. And obviously he's a, a fantastic player twice, sort of Ballon d'Or winner. Um, but yeah, some of the times he just comes out with some stuff and you're just like, why? Yeah, that that surely doesn't make any sense. I, th- I think he was always at the edge of things, and, you know. Mm. He was always leading things and trying new things. Um, you know, he was involved with uh, superstars on the TV and all that sort of thing. And it's like he just he seemed to have his finger in so many pies. And you know, I I I, I really like Kevin Keegan. I, I, oh yeah, I, you know, as, I think as he's, a player, I think he's, I think he's fa- he's fantastic value, isn't mm, he? Yeah. And and I wish I wish we heard a bit more from him um, nowadays because he he's he's sort of t- taken a step back. But yeah, de- one of a kind, yeah. definitely one of a kind. Okay, next one I'm going to look at is low paid Grant. So Celtics Peter Grant is not feeling the love at the club as he rejects signing a new long term contract. He says. There are players at this club earning four times as much as I am. I've played more than 400 games for Celtic, but I'm not being well looked after financially, and the money I've been offered is simply not good enough. Now, as a spoiler, he re- uh, re-signed and stayed for another four years and ended up playing a total of 483 games in all competitions. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but I think he's he's well-loved at the club. He was a great servant for them, and you know he was one of these people you can say was a Celtic man through and through. Yeah, you know it was probably the likes of the Stuart Stuart Slaters and players like that that were coming up who were on this sort of money. I'd imagine it's the ones that were coming up from England, um, you know, and possibly from from other areas as well. So I guess it was those sort of players that were coming up, and and you know, as Stuart Slater, if he's getting four times with Peter Grant, he gets paid and only scoring three goals in a season, you know, you're going to be a bit upset about that. So I, I really don't have a a problem with with Peter there. So I don't know. Was there anything else on on that page that I haven't picked out that you want to? That anybody wants to? It was just there was a, it was a couple of small things for me. One, there's something in the 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 worst team thing, mm-hmm. which I found. I just can't imagine people doing now. I think it's really of its time where they just seem to get a fan to write in basically to give a, an 11 of players that they don't like. Yeah. Um, with no, with no rationale as well. It's just, you know, put into hit. you know, some of them you can kind of, well, I, I get why you might not like Vinnie Jones, but you know, 
what have you got against Darren Anderton? He's completely inoffensive, you know, type, <laughs> yeah. type thing. So I, I like the fact that, that that was just there as a, 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 as a feature. And then there was there was something about Ballon d'Or voting where the um, uh, Papua New Guinea uh, manager was voting for his own players. So what? So so one of them finished uh, in the top fifteen in the world in the in the Ballon d'Or, which I think is. Why not? You know, you, it's you know, it's you know, he, he's backing his players. He's doing what the Halifax manager didn't do, and uh, I'm sure they love him for yeah. it. I think he finished above Gary Lineker. Was that right? Is that what they said then? I mean, I mean, in 1992, you should finish above Gary Lineker. <laughs> I mean, he, yeah. he, let's be fair, he was substituted for a reason against yeah. Sweden. Yeah, I think in the, in, in the the article that you mentioned, I, I think they suggest that they weren't sure whether he misread the rules, but I'd, I'd like to think that he didn't. I'd like to think that he just. Did it for you? Maybe they're just the best players he saw, and he's just like, I, do you know what? I've I've not I've not seen Dennis Bergkamp mm. or Marco van Basten in the flesh. I'm gonna go with what I know. Exactly, exactly. Anything anything you picked out, Tom? Or uh, uh, that picture of uh, Al- Alan Cork, bald head, big beard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, looks great. I don't know what age he was at that time. Probably well in his thirties, but. I mean, he could be like twenty one. You know? <laughs> yeah. There wasn't wasn't many beards in, in football at that time, I don't think. No. no. A few moustaches as we can see, Terry McDermott, mm. um, but yeah, beards. There wasn't a lot, no. Okay, we're gonna move along and we're gonna to go to pages six and seven. Let's just find them up. So this is my strife next door. So this is a two page spread that looks at the upcoming FA Cup semi final at Wembley between Sheffield United and Sheffield Wednesday. Shoot speaks to John Pemberton of Sheffield United, who reveals his next-door neighbour is Sheffield Wednesday player Roland Nielsen. Pemberton says, We know we're not the most gifted team around, but we're in the top three when it comes to spirit. It would have been nice to have met in the final, but I'm glad we're playing each other. And Pemberton talks about the passion and excitement of a Sheffield derby and believes the semi at Wembley will have an unbelievable atmosphere. The page also talks about how Pemberton took part in one of the greatest semi-finals of all time in 1990 when Crystal Palace beat Liverpool 4-3 after extra time. He also backs up the shoot editor's earlier point by insisting that the semi should not be played at Wembley, saying that if one is to be played there, then both should be, have been as well, which I guess backs up this idea that you know, you know, um, Spurs and Arsenal probably asked for it. And then because of that, I'm guessing that's partly why Sheffield, the Sheffield teams asked for it as well. Wednesday also has a Coca-Cola League Cup final with Arsenal to look forward to. Uh, now, as a spoiler, Wednesday would get the better of their City rivals with a 2-1 win after extra time. Chris Waddle opened the scoring for Wednesday before Cork equalised for United just before half-time. Um, Mark Bright was to get the winner in 108 minutes to take them through to the FA Cup final, where they would again meet Arsenal. Uh, now in the other we'll, we'll talk about this bit in, as well but in the other semi-final Arsenal went on to beat Spurs uh, with a late Tony Adams winner and for the final itself it ended 1-1 with a goal from Ian Wright of Arsenal being cancelled out by David Hurst of Sheffield Wednesday and so it went to replay uh, five days later again it was level 1-1 at full time and Ian Wright again on the score sheet and Chris Waddle got the equaliser for Wednesday and in the last minute of extra time Arsenal's Andrew Linningham got the winner. Now, previous to that, they were in the Coca-Cola Cup final with Arsenal, and Arsenal won that one 2-1 as well. So, so unfortunately for Sheffield Wednesday, they lost out twice within you know a couple of weeks to Arsenal. Um, Sheffield Wednesday were going to finish 7th place on 59 points, along with Liverpool and Spurs in the league. You, you said, do you, rem- do you remember anything about the semi-finals from that? This this is my peak football watching time. I remember almost everything about the semi finals, the the League Cup final, the final, and and the replay. It was just it was that time when I was young and just focused in on 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 everything as mm. well. And be, and because at the time as well, you'd lost a lot of you'd lost um, domestic foot like league football to to Sky. Yeah. So the games that were on the BBC or ITV, I can't remember who had the FA Cup at that time, were really special because they were the only chance that you get you get to watch it. Um the 
the Chris Waddle goal in the semi-final is superb. I think it's Barry Davis commentating as well as like, you know, basically he's like, he's not going to hit it from here. He's not going to hit it from, and then, and then he just goes mad because he's, he's, he's stroked it in from like 35 yards. Um, you know, that that's what stands out for me from that. The League Cup final is, I know it might not be strictly in the purview of this magazine, but is the, is the famous one where they drop Steve Morrow Arsenal when they're celebrating um, he'd scored the winning mm. goal and they're and Tony Adams and a few others are throwing him up sort of like in, in celebration after the final whistle and they just forget to catch him he breaks <laughs> his arm he can't get he, he can't he can't go and get his medal they have to get like paramedics on and, and he when missed, he says it effectively ended his Arsenal career oh, right? yeah, yeah absolutely I mean he doesn't he doesn't get to play in the final um, I mean I think he was sort of on the fringes anyway but mm. obviously he's playing in, in that in that League Cup final um, and then maybe people like Eddie McGoldrick come in um, you, know, you know sort of the, you know versatile sort of midfielders um, but yeah I mean yeah they dropped him, they dropped him and that was him done basically pretty harsh yeah the, the final is the final replay this is the last time that there was a replay in the FA Cup right. um, after that it um, the next time it was finished level it, it, it got it got finished by extra time and penalties and that final was about a minute away from going to penalties before Andy Linnigan scored an absolute towering header. And I remember Chris Woods on the line, sort of, I don't know, you know, how goalkeepers are supposed to make themselves really big. Yeah. Chris Woods had decided that was the moment to make himself really small. <laughs> and Linnigan just powered this header over him. And he, I just looked at him and I was just like, you're supposed to be the England goalie. That doesn't look very good. A little bit of information about John Pemberton. So he was a defender who was born in Oldham in 1964. He played for Crewe, Crystal Palace, Sheffield United and Leeds United as well. One of the photographs on the page I quite like is shows Pemberton and Nielsen literally posing across their garden fence with the, their respective kits on as well. So I love that, that they've actually taken a photo, you know, in their gardens. So, you know, I like that wee thing there. Moving on to the other semi-final, so pages 8 and 9, these two pages took a look at Arsenal versus Spurs. Now, just a year after facing each other in the ZDS Cup final between Norton Forest and Southampton, Teddy, Teddy Sheringham and Neil Ruddock now find themselves in the same Spurs side as they return to Wembley. Sheringham recalls playing with Ruddock in Millwall's youth team, saying he was a big skinny left winger. He'd bang in the crosses and I'd tuck them away. But somewhere along the line, he's beefed up and turned into a big, ugly centre-half and is now one of the best defenders in the country. A little bit of a compliment and then taking it away a wee bit, or the other way about. But yeah, um, Neil Ruddock is is a, is a player that I remember being a really quality player. I think he was at Liverpool as well, so I, I, I really liked him as well. The next one, meanwhile, Vinnie Samways of Spurs will go into hiding, apparently, if Arsenal win as many of his cousins and friends are Gooners. He recalls the Gaza's free kick in 1991 semi-final that you spoke about against Arsenal, saying, I was standing behind the ball and Paul appeared and told me to get out of the way because he was going to shoot. I remember thinking, don't be so stupid, but there was no stopping him. It was one of the best goals I've ever seen. And it was, to be fair, I mean, it was an absolute bullet, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, and David Seaman's in the goal. It's not like, you know, he's... He's just stroked it into into the into the top uh, into the top right corner. Mm. It was amazing. Yeah, and I think I think he was he was sort of covering that side as well, wasn't he? I, I don't think he was over on the other side. Um, I think the maybe he was sort of centered of the goal, but I, I don't think he was too far. Out. Yeah, I think it was one of those because it was so far out. It w- you wouldn't put a lot in the wall, would you? Mm. You know, because it, it was a seriously it was a seriously long distance. So he's probably relatively central. Yeah. Uh, and wondering what what Gascoigne's going to do because he's he's probably also covering the fact that there might be a little cross or a little dink in as well. But you know, Gascoigne only had one thing on his mind apparently. Yeah. Uh, so the next article on this page is from Andy Gray, and he's giving Ian Wright some advice in another section of the page and suggests that he could take a leaf out of Neil Ruddock's book as his fiery temper continues to land him in trouble. Now Gray says, "I'm a big fan of him. He needs to look at players like Neil Ruddock and Paul Ince." We're both fiery characters who have calmed down and become better players as a result. Ian Wright is pictured stretching for a ball while Neil Ruddock is shown in celebrity mood and the Gaza free kick is shown as well. Arsenal, Spurs, Ian Wright, I guess he, at, at the point Ian Wright was a little bit, there was a bit of a, 
nastiness to him at times, wasn't there, in his play? Yeah, certainly. He he had an edge. I mean, you know what you know where he came from and to the sort of hard road that he had into football. He, you know, he, he only got into professional football quite late. Um, you know, f- through Crystal Palace, and I think he was sort of making up, for, making up for lost time. I remember the um, it's a few years after this, but he def- I remember him going in studs up on Peter Schmeichel, mm-hmm. um, which was quite a little famous, a famous incident. But it it certainly amuses me that the idea of, of Razor Ruddock is, is is the is the role model that you want to be as a, as a, a, a as a calming influence. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't ever remember Neil Ruddock being being calm. Um, never. <laughs> not now, not ever. Yeah. Okay, so we're going well, to... Well, I, I was going to, Andy, just talk about that picture of Andy Gray. Right. Because I think it's a picture you would maybe just... His pose is coy. He's got his hand up yeah. on, his, on his, his neck. I don't know. Well, it are, we, are we sure it's his hand? Mm. You know, and might might be somebody else's. No, but I know what you mean. It's a sort of, it's it's quite a relaxed pose. Isn't it? Like just just sit back and, you know, it's it's, it's 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 one of those paint me like your French, French. It's not hairy sort of enough thing. to be Richard Keys's hand. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good shout. Good shout. Um, so next page we're going to look at is page ten, and it's know your stuff. So shoots shoots search for a super brain. I quite like this. Um, shoot put ten questions to four four of the game's top stars in a knockout competition. And in this week's issue, they've whittled it down to the quarterfinals. This is the second set of the quarters, as Stuart Pearce and John Hendry have already booked a place in the semis. This week sees Tony Cotty of Everton come up against Robbie Earl of Wimbledon, and Mark Bright of Sheffield United faces Brian Borrows of Coventry City. So we, we know at this point that it's going to be, you know, mastermind um, sort of quality. Tony Cotty got the answer. Um, so both games ended equal and so it went to a tiebreaker where they had to guess the record attendance for a football match anywhere in the world and they say Tony Cotty got the answer absolutely spot on leading to shoot referring to him as a smart arse and they've actually written that with an answer of 199,584 now if you know that then you, you know you're a right um, you are a super brain but if, if you don't there's something dodgy going on with that I mean, it's one of those that I remember reading, you know, in those sort of football stats books. Like, you know, our bro f- win 36 nil. Mm. You knew that there was 199,000 at the American R. I don't, I want to know how Tony Cotty knows that stat, but doesn't know which club, club plays at Bootham Crescent. <laughs> mm. Mm. I don't understand how you could, how you can know one and not know the other. It's, it's insane. Mm. Yeah. But this was my favourite. This, this, this growing up, this was always my favourite bit of Shoot magazine. This, this, this feature. This is basically what I bought it for. I don't know why I cared whether players knew these pointless trivia, but I did. And this, you know, and I, I was invested in this. This mm. is what I would read. So, so would you, when when you would get the magazines, would you maybe like put a bit of paper over the answers and then? go through thought, the questions I don't, something I don't like think that. I went to the level of putting the paper over the answers but I would I would I would just read down it and I'd be like yeah I know more than them but, right. and that and that that was enough for me but yeah this is uh I don't yeah I was a weird kid don't worry about me <laughs> I'm, I'm still I'm a weird adult now it doesn't matter yeah. um but yeah I, I love I love this and this this is such nostalgia for mm. me so Mark Bright was the closest in the other game leading to the semi-finals Mark Bright versus Tony Cotty and Stuart Pearce versus John Hendry. Now, as I'm reading through this, I had said to myself, go and find out who won. I forgot to do that, so that, there we go. Listen, I, I will I will tweet it out after this podcast when I find it out, but it'll be interesting to know. We who play, should we play some bets? <laughs> right, okay. So we've got Mark Bright, Tony Cotty, Stuart Pearce and John Hendry. Um, I'm going to go right. for Mark Bright. I have no reason for this, but I I am being drawn to John Hendry. So we've got Mark Bright or John Hendry. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll find that out. It will be in the it'll be in the collection somewhere. Um, so moving on to page eleven. So just across the page, there's an advert for Man United videos and a monthly club magazine. So the magazine is modelled by both Ryan Giggs and George Best as they hold up the magazine as if they're reading it. 
Um, it's available for, from news agents for £1.95 or you can get 12 issues for £22 if you use the supplied form to subscribe. Now interestingly, just one of the wee things that I, I noticed was nowhere on the page does it say advertisement. You know, nowadays you have to put that on a magazine or something if, if it's an advert. But um, yeah, it's... Uh, Ryan Giggs looks a wee bit serious and George Best looks a wee bit sort of... Um, Amused by it, I guess, doesn't he? Yeah, it's it's a it's 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 a nice advert, you know, mm-hmm. l- linking the generations. And I think um, I really like the the advert on the back of the the one that Best is holding with the um, advertising that the new the new strip is a hundred years old. That's a you know, I'm I work in marketing, and that's a nice bit of copywriting. Yeah, I think, I think that's really nice. Okay, next page, we're on pages 12 and 13, and it's Shoot International. So this takes us to look at some fo- um, football stories a- around the globe, and I'm going to pick out a few again. And then the first one, in Brazil, a game between Operario and Apucarin was held up as a six-foot cobra sl- slithered onto the park. Apparently the, the goalkeeper um, picked it up and got rid of it. Um, yeah, I, w- I wouldn't be hanging around too long after that, I'm afraid. Um, but I guess that's probably daily life in, in Brazil, or that's me being a wee bit sort of um, general, uh, I suppose. Next one I'm going to look at, disgraced Olympic athlete Ben Johnson wants to play football in Italy. He revealed the following in a TV interview. He says, it's not such a strange idea. I love soccer, I've got a good shot, and I control the ball well. Now, if there's one thing we know about what what you need to make the grade as a professional footballer, you need to A, love the game, B, have a good shot, and be able to control the ball well, isn't it? And there's no more to it than that. Um, did did they did they ever do anything? Did they ever go anywhere? I don't be- I don't believe so. Mm. Um, obviously, a few years later, Usain Bolt did. Yeah, he pl- he pl- he played down in Australia, um, and scored. I think didn't Bolt score? I can't so remember. Ben, but... I, d- I mean, th- at this point, Ben Johnson had. Um, He'd come back to sprinting and and been, and was really slow when he wasn't on the drugs, and so then he went back on the drugs and got caught again. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I, yeah, I don't know. It's, I'm sure nothing came of it. Yeah. And um, so the next one, Jean Pierre Papin, has revealed that he'll quit the game within three years. The 29 year old knows he's not getting any younger, saying, "I haven't fixed the precise date yet, but I don't think I'll be around for the 1998 World Cup." And as a spoiler, he'd be going to play up to 2001. So he moved to Bayern Munich in 94 from Milan before spells back in France. And he scored nearly 350 goals in over 620 games in total and played for France 54 times, scoring 30 goals. He scored 181 goals in 279 games for Marseille. I mean, he was a that's an absolutely outstanding goal-scoring record, that. But I, the, the thing that I remember that sticks with me the most about Jean-Pierre Pan, Pan was that he just he struck the ball so well so crisp and it's like I don't remember ever seeing a player before it strike it the way that he did I th- I think he's one of the best volleyers of the ball there's ever been um, in, in France you know we, we often talk about some players like maybe Mark Hughes or Paul Scholes over mm. here in France they refer to uh, like a like one of those sort of dipping volleys as un papinade <laughs> Uh, it's so it's sort of named it's sort of named after him, uh, but yeah, absolutely phenomenal player. And I will pick him up on here at the bottom. He says, "I'm." He hits back at rumours that he's unhappy in Milan and he's claiming he's he's very happy. He was not. He hated Milan. <laughs> he thought he was going there as the main striker. He thought they were moving on Van Basten. Uh, they did not, and then they brought in more f- uh, foreign players to compete with him. He had a he had a horrible time in Milan. Yeah. I just, you know, this thing about he's only going to play for another three years and what, it was another five years or something after that before he... I think his um, last um, 96 or something was maybe his last game for France, so... What was it, 96? Um, what was it he says? He's, yeah, 96, so he didn't make the, the 98 World Cup, obviously, but he certainly still had quite a few years left in him. Um, and again, that, that France kit, very similar to the, the Rangers one as well. Um, to a degree, I suppose. I like that France kit. It's mm-hmm. very nice. Yeah. 
Okay, and next one to look at is in Belgium, Philippe Albert is fighting to repair his tarnished image just weeks after being named Footballer of the Year. The Anderlecht star is accused of spitting on an opponent in a cup tie and says, I would never do anything dishonourable or unworthy of my title. I know that children and young people look up to footballers as their heroes and I would never break that trust. Now, I couldn't find out much actually about this incident. The only thing that I really could find that he was suspended for six months. I don't know if he appealed or anything. Does anybody have any any insight to that? Any knowledge about what happened? I, I know he came to Newcastle under a bit of a cloud. Mm. Um, and there, there had been a, a falling out in Belgium, and, that, and that's what that's when he turned he turns up at Newcastle. But no, I, I, is he saying that he he would never spit at someone because he was named Footballer of the Year? <laughs> is that the title? Because yeah. I would just never spit at someone anyway. Yeah. And, but is is that why he won't spit at someone? Yeah, yeah. He's basically saying that based on his title. So if he had a lesser title, he might spit at somebody. If he, if, he, if he was player of the week, would he spit at somebody? <laughs> Is that the answer? Yeah, you really could read into that that way. But um, yeah, I, I, I really couldn't find out much about it. So maybe, maybe there's one of these super gag things on, on Google or something <laughs> that hides all the all the search results. Okay, we'll move on to across on the second page is a chance to win win a signed England shirt by answering the following question: Which European club does David Platt play for? A Juventus, B Lazio, or C Sampdoria. I will open it up to the floor. I think I know. I don't know if Tom wants to go first. <laughs> no, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I was wasn't paying attention. Andy, sorry, <laughs> what was what was the oh, question? No. You should have just passed like you did the last time. I know. I should have. Let's like, say that that in pass. Right. Which European club does David Platt play for? Is it A um, Juventus, B Lazio, or C Sampdoria? I'm going to say Sampdoria. Okay, I think at this time it's Juventus. I think he eventually does play for Sampdoria, mm. um, but I think this is because he goes Bari, Juventus, and then Samp. So that would be my answer. Do you know what? It's I just assumed it was uh, Sampdoria as well, so I never bothered looking up. So let's <laughs> let's have a, let's have a wee quick Google about that. Um, a, yeah. a big part of our podcast, James, is, is trying to go. Now, did he, did he go from there to there or? Uh, no, he was with them. That, that's a big, a big chunk, a big chunk of our episodes. Is just, just trying to remember what other players um, went through transfers in. Yeah, I think Juve had to change. we sort of change, changing over their team. Um, there was a lot. Of, I mean, you, you look at Serie A in in that time. This the concentration of talent. You're getting fantastic players in Serie B. Georgie Hadji played for Brescia in Serie. You know, you the fact that. Platt and Gascoigne and Walker were, you know, they weren't at, when they went over. They weren't at big clubs. It isn't really an indictment on them. It's just it was so mm. difficult to get in because only Milan signed more than three three foreigners. Everyone else just kept kept to the three because you could only play three. Whereas Berlusconi was like, I'll have six. <laughs> it's just like, why? Because that means you can't have them. Okay, so the 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 results are in, and he moved to. Sampdoria in July 1993 so at this point he was in Juventus so well done absolutely brilliant that yeah you can and one of the things about this this ad, this competition thing and it's it's a bugbear of mine and it's been a bugbear of mine for so many years that I refuse to say the S word you know what I mean Tom yes it, it should be the M word for me it's always a marathon Mm. it's always a marathon <laughs> if I go into a shop and I know this is petty if I go into a shop and I can't find, and I'm can't, i looking for a marathon and I can't find it I say where's your marathons and they say oh my Snickers I'll just walk out I'll just walk out and it's, I'm that petty when it comes to this I mean that's I'm not I, I, I wish I knew that before agreeing to come on this podcast <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I will I will caveat it by saying that it's never happened but <laughs> It's just in my mind that it, that's what I would. That's how I would react to that situation if if I was ever in it. I challenge you to do that tomorrow. Go uh, go to your local news agent and ask for a marathon and see what happens. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. I'll, I'll 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 think about that one. I'll think about that one. Um, moving on to page thirteen, page fourteen and fifteen, and this is where should speak to a number of the big stars and find out who they think will win the league with just six weeks to go. 
Man United and Aston Villa are the two teams leading the charge, while Norwich City are just about hanging in there. So first up, Tony Derigo of Leeds. He tips Man United. John Fashionu of Wimbledon is convinced Villa will win due to the personality of Ron Atkinson. He thinks Villa are relaxed while United are feeling the pressure. Neil Ruddock tips Villa and wants to see Paul McGrath win a championship medal as the best player in the league. Mark Walters tips Villa as he believes they have the slight edge when it comes to playing good football. Andy Townsend of Chelsea is a bit like Tom and can't pick a winner. Uh, Lee Dixon of Arsenal tips Villa as well saying... I was a City fan and anything that stops United from winning the league will do for me. So in, in future when anybody asks me, why don't you want England to win, I'm just going to point them towards this quote from Lee Dixon and just say, ask Lee Dixon why he doesn't want Man United to win anything. It's the same reason. Uh, next up, Tony Cotty goes for Villa as well, saying that they have an easier run-in. Niall Quinn of Man City goes for Villa, agreeing with Tony Cotty that they have an easier run-in as well. Tim Flowers of Southampton tips for Villa. And Deal, Dean Holdsworth of Wimbledon goes for United. So it's top heavy by far on Aston Villa at this point. Now, um, as a spoiler, Man United obviously went on to win this season. Uh, and Villa was full away. They lost their last three games that season. So, it, you know, it did um, come... It must have been really hurtful for Villa fans for that to happen. Um, that, as I say, I think that was the inaugural Premier League season this, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it it was, and I'm I'm surprised even at this point of the season, just how many players are openly supporting Villa and just wanting. Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm a bit shocked by it. I mean, in terms of, I remember this from a very very weird perspective. I remember going to my first sort of football trials, and and the, what they did was they split us into three teams, and one of us had to pretend to be Man United, one of us had to pretend to be Villa, and one of us had to pretend to be Norwich. And uh, and they made us play each other. And uh, Man United won that, and obviously they won the league. And I played for Norwich and never made it as a footballer. Um, but yeah, so that was yeah. I just I just don't remember Villa being this far ahead. Mm. I just it, it and maybe they were. It just doesn't chime with my memory. Yeah, and maybe it was just they they wanted Villa to to yeah. win more than they they actually expected them to win. But um, yeah. I mean, when you look at, as I say, when you look at the, the, the table at the end of the season, I think there was like um, seven points or something. No, it would have been more than that for three points for one at that point. Um, but there was a significant gap, which doesn't obviously show how, how the, the race has gone throughout a season. But, you know, for, for them to lose the last three games was just an absolute, yeah, it just, boom. They just didn't have the legs, I guess, to, to see it through. Um Okay, moving on to page 19, and we have the golden goal, so let's flick this up the right way, and this is number 34 of the golden goals, is Jean-Pierre Papin again for AC Milan versus Porto from 1993. And the page shows a photo of Papin firing a shot towards a Porto goal, while an inset graphic of the goal is also shown. The ball is played to Simone from Costa Curta from within the Milan half, it was then crossed to Papan, who had a spectacular volley past the bamboozled Porto keeper. Now, the graphic is a bit confusing for me because it looks as though Simone is actually crossing with his foot, with his body language, but the lines shows his head, which is what happened. He did header it. And also, the he was a lot closer, and, and I know this is just a representation of it, but he was a lot closer to the 18-yard circle than that. Um, so... Plus, I guess, actually, now I think about it, I mean, that's not 18 yards either for the box, is it? It's, it's, I guess they're taking a bit of artistic licence with us now I think about it, so maybe I shouldn't um, criticise it as much as I was going in there. But, um, I, was about... I mean, if they're, all, if they're all to scale, Jean-Pierre Papin is about 18 foot tall. <laughs> or it's five a side. Maybe it's five a side they're playing <laughs> for that. But um, Yeah, I mean, it's. I've, I've watched that again. I remember the goal, but I've watched it again a couple of times recently, and it's just... You know, you're talking about the way, you know, that they say striking a ball certain ways, you know, the Papan way. And it was, it was just outside his right foot, just perfect, um, which, you know, goes back to, as I say, I just haven't seen a player strike a ball as well as him, certainly up to that point. Okay, uh, moving on to, it's on the same page, or the next page is another advert, advert, and it's for Lane Leisure, and it shows Liverpool and Rangers Adidas quilted jackets. And the 
The Rangers one is modelled by Richard Goff, and both are available for £39.99, so not cheap at all. I mean, they're, they're, they're classic designs, aren't they? Yeah, big coats, aye. Yeah. Aye, lovely for that, yeah. you know. Yeah, classic designs. But, you know, £40 back then, was it 65 pence for the front cover? Um, mm. Yeah, it's... You know, the, the, the price of some of the gear, is then and now, is just... You know, it really is prohibitive for for a lot of people. So uh, I, I love the idea on this that you could get it unbadged if you wanted to, mm. as if there was any reason to have this other than to show your affiliation with Liverpool or or or, or Rangers. Mm. The idea that you just wanted a green and red coat and you'd willing yeah. you'd be willing to pay forty quid for it. Yeah, yeah or a coat in Rangers colours. Yeah, without the bat, it just, it just <laughs> yeah. Can I have? Can I pay full price for this and make it look like a knockoff, please? That's what I would like to do. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, and we're moving on to pages 18 and 19. So Greaves' letter pages, which is always, you know, worth, worth a, a few little uh, comments. So I'm going to, the, the star letter on the page wins a pair of Mitsuno Pro boots, which are pictured. And I think they're a really good looking pair of football boots. I don't know what anybody else thinks. I mean, I don't know what they would like to wear, but they, they look fair enough. They look, um, they don't look too solid, but they, they're just a good looking pair. Yeah, just just a, just classic, aren't yeah. they? There's not, there's not, there's not too many frills with that. Yeah, they'd be fine. Yeah, quite. You know, they sort of remind me of the the Adidas, um, the World Cups or something like that. You know, just that sort of the the shape of the sole and the colours in the sole. But as you say, I mean, it's just it's two colours, black and white. I tell you what, though, those studs look massive. <laughs> in terms of, uh, you, you, you know, you wouldn't want to be playing on a, a rock hard summer pitch in those, would you? Yeah. I certainly remember with studs, it, there was two kinds. There was those nylon ones, and then you had the rubber ones, which were a, a, a bit um, smaller. And I don't know, would you have ever experienced the rubber ones, James? Or was that just really for playing on um, gravel pitches and stuff, Tom? Yeah, the, the rubber ones, uh, well, that yeah. was... Well, what we did with them is play on the uh, the red ash yeah. with them. So the, I also remember the the, the rub, So <laughs> this this has gone back, but the rubber ones would wear away, and it would just leave the like the metal bit, which is <laughs> was really dangerous. Um, I mean, the, the not so much with the nylon ones, but yeah, they are quite. I mean, I have a problem with modern day football boots. A big problem um, because I think a lot of the you know sometimes there's little contacts and. It's obvious that the players really hurt, but they go down, you know, you know, and it's like it's just brushed your foot or something. And I think it's because the the leather around them is just so thin, or mm. you know, if it's a synthetic material, it's just so thin. Plus, most of the the studs now are probably aren't far off those sort of sizes either. Plus, the the sort of squ- you know, rather than round, the the sort of squarish as well. I think nowadays. So I, I just I just think. We've removed any sort of protection from boots, but we've not thought about what the the impact of, you know, the studs on that is. And I think I think that's something that they maybe should look at in the game. Other than taking away completely all contact whatsoever, I think you know because quite often you, you you see a a foot or a two players go in, one of them just sort of clips the foot, and quite often you'll get booked for it or something. And I think that's for me that that's not really a booking. They've just came into contact. This yeah, I one hundred percent agree with you. This was the sort of time where I would have one pair of boots and I would change the studs between football and rugby because mm. you weren't allowed the plastic studs between rugby. But could you imagine trying to play in rugby in a modern football boot with the the lack of protection that offers you? These were proper, as in you know that that you know if someone stood on you yeah it hurt but like you were give it wasn't it wasn't you weren't rolling around on the floor and you weren't you weren't felled by it yeah. uh you know so um yeah i like them yeah. Hope, w- one day i'll i'll get a star letter and shoot and i'll, I'll have a <laughs> pair of these yeah okay so the other ones actually i think they anybody else gets five pound for each of the letters which is not bad not bad at all so the next one we're gonna look at is well the first one is the winner which is carl winters of hayes and middlesex and for me I mean, unless they've edited it down, is it's really to win the Starlight on those boots based on this. It's what four lines, and he says, "In the light of recent pitch invasions by Man City and Cardiff fans, do you think hooliganism is starting to return to soccer?" So Greaves' um, response to that is he hopes not and doesn't believe there was the same aggress- aggressive and intimidating atmosphere at these incidents as there was during previous years of hooliganisms. 
Yeah, so, yeah, it was right. I mean, the, that sort of hooliganism never really came back um, to the degree that it was there um, before all this. Um, but I just I, I just thought it was quite, um, you know, such such a small, um, succinct letter. You know, you just send in and suddenly you win it. And everybody else is probably, you know, how, how do I form this better? And, you know, is there any clever words I can come up with? So sometimes simple is best. A couple of good photographs there for me, though. Uh, with the, I mean, the, the policeman with that guy on, on the pitch, it's a very definition of huckling. Yeah. Uh, the way the police is, and you, you can see this a grimace in the policeman's face. Mm. I, I, I like to think that maybe that's his underwear that the policeman's got a hoodie rather than <laughs> his, his shirt or something. I, I, to, talking about gear as well, all the policemen pictured have got like the proper helmet on, you know, mm. that they don't that they don't wear. You know that that's 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 what a police uh, uh, police doing crowd control should be wearing. Yeah, I mean, especially um, in in case of female streakers, that's that's what they're there for, isn't it? Um, to, or or male streakers to to cover their modesty. Yeah. Um, so on to the next one, and uh, next one I'm going to look at is Paul Buckley of Oxen, who says he'll be really upset if Glenn Hoddle follows through with his threat to quit the game if FIFA introduce their stupid kick-in rule. He grieves he doesn't know anyone that's in favour of it and says it would massively change the game. Now, when I read this. I, I, I don't really remember anything at the time, but I think I've maybe heard something since then. But my God, what a stupid idea! They're absolutely right. I mean, can you imagine what it would do to the game? I think they trialed it. I think I remember. I think they trialed it in English non-league for a season or something. Yeah, certainly at, at one level, because uh, it was it was often talked about, um, sort of early nineties. And when you think about it, it's like well, obviously it just it just makes the game terrible mm. because there's there's no way you know it becomes a territory game rather than a pos- rather than a possession game, uh, and the incentive is to you know to put the defence on the back you know and to try and get them to hoof it out so you can so you can have a, a free set piece. Yeah. But yeah, I, th- I think it was just it's just awful, and I don't understand how it even got to a sort of trial stage. Um, I can't remember ever seeing a game where it was in but you just I, f- I don't remember I, I, like I says I don't I don't remember anyone who was in favour of it but I will say to Paul Buckley of Wantage in Oxfordshire uh, he'll get more upset by Glenn Hoddle as the decade goes on I'm sure <laughs> yeah that's a good point it's a good point yeah it's it's as, as you say what was the reason that they even thought about this and uh, you know there's there's lots that I can say that about a throw in which annoys me. Um, one, firstly, is the the linesmen who seem to put their flag up as soon as the ball touches the line, rather than goes over there. That that annoys me. Um, stealing yardage, all that sort of stuff. So it's, you know, there's things that they could improve in it if they wanted to. But then again, I would say just leave it alone. It's it's not the end of the world as it is. But my God, introducing the kick ins, you you would just be like you, you would you wouldn't chase balls down. You wouldn't chase um, anything down in in a corner that because there wouldn't be any point. I, th- I think one of the things that uh, FIFA were doing at this at this time that was trying to make the game more attacking after Italia ninety and how defensive it was, and they got rid of the back pass. They changed the offside rule, and both of and, and were about to outlaw the tackle from behind. So they were on this mission to kind of make the game more attacking and have more goals and and you know three of four of three of three of the of four of those things were really good mm. developments for the game this is just someone just going too far yeah I, I say that quite a bit that i think i think there's a there's an office somewhere that that's their job is to come up with rule changes for football because every season there are rule changes whether they're just slight rule changes or that and it's like why do we have to constantly change things i don't get it i really don't so yeah okay next one is um, this is David Clark of Leeds and he's continuing with the theme of the week by stating that Sheffield Derby semi-final shouldn't be played at Wembley but that should be played north Um, there we go Stuart Murray of Falkirk asks if Rangers have any chance of getting a result against Marseille in the European Cup with Mark Hately suspended for the game now, Greavesy thinks Marseille will start as slight favourites with Hately out, but says Rangers still have a lot of skill and passion in their side. He mentioned that they have surprised a lot of people with their play, including himself. Now, for Greavesy to say that, that's it's not really something Greavesy normally comes out and holds his hand up and says, yep, 
have been proved wrong. But um, I guess that was the certainly from the the Leeds game. From that point, the people started to take take note of Rangers. I think so. In 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 the English media, um, there was certainly a lot of uh, I guess American sports would call it bulletin board material uh, for for Rangers in of, of how the English media talked about them. Even after, even after they'd won the first leg mm. um, of uh, 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 Ibrox, because it was two one, and they thought Leeds had the away goal, and a lot of um, a lot of people not wrote them off because I, I don't think it ever get got to that level. But it was oh, it's only two one. Well, you know, Le- Leeds Leeds will beat them at Ellen Road type thing. Um, but obviously, as that campaign went on, and they had the the great comeback against Marseille at Ibrox to draw two two. Uh, a, a win against uh, CSK Moscow, uh, some two good games against Bruges. People were starting to see, you know, see Rangers more yeah. uh, and see that there was something about that team. And yeah, I think, I think by this point in the season, they'd, they'd sort of become, you know, Britain's team. Maybe the whole of Glasgow wasn't behind them, but almost the whole of the rest of Britain was behind them yeah. um, as, as, as they were sort of taking on Europe as, as sort of a plucky underdog. And I do remember the sense of everyone getting behind Rangers and wanting them to win mm. yeah the whole of Glasgow the rest of uh, outside Glasgow I probably weren't that much behind them either certainly <laughs> if that was nowadays that would be the case as I, I spoke about the front of the magazine I just think you know the the strips at this point um, weren't the best and they were getting worse so I've picked out a couple here the Chris Waddle Sheffield uh, Wednesday one the away one isn't really the, the greatest, even actually the Ipswich one behind, I don't think it's magnificent either, but it's okay, but the Chris Sutton for Norwich, where it's a sort of um, speckled paint effect type thing um, just doesn't do it for me, and I know Tom Tom and I are Clyde Bank supporters and we had a, a red very similar one to this at, um, around about the time, um, red with white and black speckles on it, and you know, as much as you love your team and everything you, you do look at the strips and just go, nah, not for me. I have less problem with the Norwich one than I do with the QPR one. And that's because of the sponsor. Because They've got a classic FM sponsor and it ruins the hoops mm. on the QPR strip because the sponsor's logo is too big and, and their white logo sort of eats into the blue hoop. Yeah. And that is more offensive to me than, than the Norwich one. Yeah, No, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a fair point as well, yeah. What about you with these strips, Tom? You well, take any offence to anything? I kind of like the Sheffield Wednesday one. I kind of like the, the yellow and blue. But it's another one of the, those ones where the sponsor's logo looks kind of stitched on. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, uh, the shirts arrived and then, you know, 22 separate logos <laughs> arrived and they get a steam ironed on or something like that. And the Ipswich one, again, both Ipswich and Sheffield Wednesday have got big crests. And again, the Ipswich one's kind of like the Aston Villa one we looked at earlier on, where it's got that kind of, I don't know, sort of 50s style mm. with sort of lace-up, crisscross lace-up on, on the neck. And again, and the QPR shirts, just like you were talking about, Andy, it seems quite big. Yeah. And I, I, I sort of recall Ray Wilkins, maybe remember that time, playing for QPR in an absolutely massive shirt. Yeah. Yeah, not, not the greatest for me. I, I have to admit, as I say, th- there was a, a right period during the nineties in particular. I just thought, yeah. Okay, moving on to pages twenty and twenty one. So this is Stephen's the Mar- main event now, yeah. James. <laughs> Stephen's Marseille misery. So this uh, these two pages take a look at Rangers player Trevor Stevens as he mulls over his year in France with Marseille, stating they are not in the same league as Rangers. So he opens up after returning to Glasgow with the Jairs, saying that things started reasonably well after some initial problems overcoming the club supporters, with many questioning his £5.5 million fee. But within months, he was beginning to get caught up in contractual problems with the club, saying, I signed a three-year contract, but from the moment I put pen to paper to to the last few hours of my time there, I never knew if I was coming or going. I had all sorts of contractual problems because the club was refusing to honour the deal in many ways and in substantial ways. Now, Trevor had problems getting paid and even went five months at one point without a wage. He also says, Marseille has a big reputation because of one man, Bernard, T- Bernard Tappy. His money put them on the map, but there's no comparison between them and Rangers. In every respect, 
The stadium, the squad, the organisation and the way the clubs are run. Rangers are head and shoulders above Marseille. And Trevor has shown in action for, Mar- for Marseille in a very smart, I, I really like this one, a very smart Adidas kit, which you touched on the front of the cover as well, James. It's all white with light blue, thick Adidas stripes diagonal in the corner, as we mentioned. Um, and another photo shows the moment Mark Hale equalised against Marseille at Ibrox the previous November. Um, so I'll, I'll just pick through the other little articles as well and then we can have a wee chat about it. So the absence of Haitley will be a big miss, says Trevor, who knows that Marseille fear him. Haitley saw red against Bruges in a previous game in an incident that Shoot describes as a dying swan routine in relation to the actions of the Bruges player involved in the in- incident. And t- there's another article, Tappies Chappies is the heading for it, where Trevor may have little or no admiration for the way Marseille is run as a club, but he picks out some of the players who he knows can perform and make a difference for him. So some of the players he, he speaks of is Fabian Bartes, who says he must be doing well to keep out fans' favourite Pascal Olmeta. Basil Bolli is mentioned as a stopper, and that's it. Although Trevor is quick to point out that he is no clown. Didier Deschamps and Frank Sosé are mentioned as the midfielders who can run the show. And in attack, we've got Rudy Vola, Alan Boxic and... Abide Pelli are all mentioned as well, so some really, some really quality names mentioned there. So Marseille, what do we, you know, what can we say about Marseille? I mean, loads. I mean, they <laughs> they were uh, they were they were fascinating at the time in terms of, um, and they're probably even more fascinating before this before this season. Um, they put together um, Tappy comes in in eighty six. Um, recruited by the town's mayor to take over the football team and, and invest in it and to and to bring it and to bring some prestige to it he'd been involved in business he had a chain of health shops and he'd got involved in cycling um so that was his first foray into sport he he, he sponsored the la vie claire team which have that very iconic um almost um i guess it's sort of i don't know what's they have a very iconic jersey in cycling sort of a cubist style jersey um looks absolutely magnificent um but he'd been very successful with 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 them with uh greg lamond and bernard hino uh, and they kind of brought him in to kind of do the do, do the same to football um and he throws you know a lot of money at the problem at one point they think they're going to sign maradona away from napoli and, and the, in the end it doesn't quite happen and they bring in waddle instead they bring it they bring in pele uh from from from, from ghana um and they get incredibly close in 1991 they lose the european cup final on penalties to red star belgrade and then tappy's eye gets taken away from the football team um they also have a, a very heartbreaking semi-final loss in 1990 against Benfica uh, with a handball goal that denies them the chance to play Mar- uh, to play Milan in the final. Uh, a clear, you know, punch into the punch into the net with ten, with ten minutes to go. Um, you know, you, we, you know, as as in, as you know, England fans still talk about it, so Marseille fans should be allowed to as well. <laughs> um, but. Tappy's eye in 91, 92 gets gets taken off into politics. He's he's invited to join the cabinet of Francois Mitterrand. He becomes the minister for cities, and he 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 starts basically divesting from football and business um, in order to focus on a potential presidential bid. So this is where the whole Trevor Stephen thing ties in because he's selling adidas at the time. He's trying to get his finances in order so he's not going to be caught up in any sort of like financial corruption so he had so he's free to run for president and this 93 run um to the champions league final is almost by accident that he's trying to make this team cheaper he sells papan for 10 million dollars he brings in rudy Voller, who's obviously a great player but much cheaper he gets rid of uh, trevor steven he goes and gets young french talent which just so happens to be the backbone of the team that would then go and win France 98 and Euro 2000. He has Barthez, he has Desailly, he has Deschamps. And their leadership, as well as the the flair of Boxic and Voller and Pelé, is, is the thing that drives them to the final. Um, they were a phenomenal team. And, and we're recording this the day after uh, Bastille Day. And the thing that uh, Marseille means, you know, this Marseille team to me, 
it's fraternity, it's a brotherhood. They're still so defensive of Tappy. And obviously what happened afterwards with the match fixing allegations and all the all the all the allegations that come against him, they all still refer to him as the boss. They're all incredibly deferential to him, all, all the players. And you will not be able to get them. And I've tried to say anything negative about him. Uh, you know, he even though for a lot of the football world he got caught up in in, in something abhorrent, the players who were there at the time love him and uh you know and, and the fans do too it's still the only um european title that that france has won uh, i know psg are trying to change that but i mean fascinating team mm. but that's me what what are your memories of marseille tom i, I remember this campaign quite well because it was it was the days where champions league football was on STV, so I, I do remember. I do remember all the all the all the Rangers games, and I do remember Marseille being quite an exciting team. I remember the ninety one final, uh, and, and I remember this uh, this run as well. I do remember them being quite an exciting side. Hmm. I, I remember f- from this campaign what I remember probably most vividly about them is, you know, Rangers were um, getting a bit of steam ahead, but then when Marseille played them at Ibrox, they absolutely played them off the park. Marseille played Rangers off the park and I think they were, were they 2-0 up yeah um, and the, it was like I, I still to this day have no idea how Rangers got a draw out of that game because it was just it was like an absolute smash and grab um, thing and it, you know it must have it must have really given a wee bit of dent to Marseille to, to know that they've, they've came to you know one of the the rivals here in in the in the competition, they've outplayed them. They've been ahead two goals and they've come away with just a point. So for me, that that was a biding memory of it. That you know they were. I don't. I, I couldn't remember seeing Rangers being dominated so much in a game as, as that game and still come out with something. And at that point, you sort of think, you know, as as much as you, you maybe you don't believe in karma and things like that you just think could this be could this be the year for rangers and ultimately it wasn't yeah i mean the i think uh ibrox actually applauds marseille the marseille team off at half time they were that good mm. in, in 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 the first half of that game but obviously credit credit to the comeback uh you know two sort of famous sort of scrambled goals uh, that, that 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 gave them the draw and gave them the chance, and then the the game that this sort of double page spread is is previewing is 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 very tense as well. Uh, Soze scores early on. Uh, Ian Durant scores a quite famous goal, I think, in mm-hmm. terms of uh, an equaliser, a real kind of rocket. Um, and then they they're trying and trying and trying, but they but ultimately they they sort of settle for a draw hoping because it, it wasn't over it would have been over if either of them won because the um the tiebreaker was head to head rather than goal difference but they went into they went into the last the last game knowing they had to you know hoping that marseille would lose away to club bruges and uh knowing and then they needed to um rangers needed to to win again at home against cska and obviously that didn't happen rangers drew and marseille won and they went on to the final mm-hmm. Okay, listen. Before we before we go into the the focus on the last thing, we're going to look at the we've got a Inter Milan team photo that we'll have a quick look through before before we go into the the focus on part. So it's a double page spread um, of the team, and for me, it's a brilliantly arranged team group. I mean, it's it's like if you've got OCD about these sort of things, you're not going to have a problem with this. I don't think. Um, it's a classic design for the, the Inter Milan top, the the light blue and the, the dark stripes. Um, now, the, the goalkeeper's top, so you've got a very bright Walter Zenger and a very bright yellow one, and then and the other two keepers, it's a light blue, which for me looks probably the same sort of light blue as the, the shirt. So um, I guess that would have only been used with the away strip, which the three coaches are wearing. So the, three, the, the only thing... You know, if I'm picking apart the the team photos, you've got the three coaches in where maybe where the goalkeepers might be, or you know they're in the middle row in the middle, um, but they're wearing the the away top, which is a white one, which is smart, very smart. I like that. Um, the kit sponsor is Fiorici, which I think was an Italian fashion label. I don't I don't think they are anymore, or they've been bought over by other uh, labels and things like that. 
Um, so some of the names that, that stand out for me, um, Igor Shalimov, Sergio Battistini, Nicola Berti, Giuseppe Bergami, Matteo Sama, David De Fontalan, Luigi De Agostini, Ruben Souza, Walter Zenga, Salvatore Scalacci, and Dan- Darko Panchev. So th- those are just some of the names that, you know, watching Italian football on Channel 4 and stuff around this sort of period, these names became not quite household names, but certainly for me, these are names that y- you associate with Italian football at that time. Um, and the goalkeepers are doing that thing that they started yeah. doing with their, their gloves, basically making them quite prominent. And if you know, I'm sure you you'll notice this, James. Um, you said you're in marketing that that's probably they're getting a little extra from their sponsor from Ul Sport for for you know putting them on their their knees and just making them so obviously out there. Yeah, they all they almost look like sort of giant fan hands things. <laughs> they, they yeah. look huge. Yeah, because okay. Andy's pointed that out before that sometimes goalkeepers in the back row will have their hands up sort of on their. Uh, on their shoulders, kind of things, showing off their showing off their gloves. But yeah, keepers right at the front there with the gloves prominent. I, th- I think it's telling as well because Zenga doesn't appear to be doing this, so he's obviously doing financially <laughs> a lot better than the other two keepers. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're, they're desperate to get all sport in there, and he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, guys. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I the inter the inter kit is iconic, mm. and I love it. Um, I don't think this is one of the the great examples of an inter kit, but no. I, I'm fine with it because they almost never they almost never mess it up. Some players in there, I mean Shalomov, incredibly underrated. He was, you know, there was a period of time in the early '90s where he was one of the outstanding players in world football, but because of the collapse of the USSR, we didn't really get to see him on the on the, on the proper stage. You're also quite fortunate here because Matteo Sama was was in Milan for literally a cup of coffee. He did not he did not settle well there. He absolutely hated it and was um, and, and and was back in Germany before you know basically by Christmas. So uh, yeah, uh, sort of an in, an inter team in transition. You've lost Bremer, you've lost Klinsmann, you've lost Matthias, and they're trying to they're trying to find. Uh, trying to find their footing and I, I don't think they managed to do it I don't I think this was they came perilously close to relegation this season either this season or the season after they went into the last day almost being with the chance of being relegated so um, but you know still look beautiful and mm. that's the main thing <laughs> that's the main thing yeah yeah I mean, a couple of other we pointed out so there's, there's pictures in front of a hedge yeah and mm-hmm. there seems to be people cut out of the picture yeah, I noticed that on the right-hand side, especially, there looks as though there's another coach which hasn't been... I mean, that's not even just the cropping I've done. And then they, they put Total Scalacci as an inset photo, mm. even though he's in the team photo, <laughs> which is, is a bit of a strange one as well. Uh, and Scal- Scalacci has a completely different demeanour to every single other person in this photo. Everyone else has got that kind of school picture. Let's get it over with. Whereas Scalacci <laughs> seems to be having some sort of issue with the photographer and staring him out. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So what we'll do next is we'll jump out the magazine and we'll do a focus on. So it's a focus on yourself, James. So I'm going to fire some questions at you. Okay. They're none oh, of them. Dear. They're not set to trip you up, so don't worry. Um, but just give me the the answer to as best you can. So full name. James Philip Dixon. What was your birthplace? Uh, a hospital in Moseley, Birmingham, which got knocked down soon after I was born. Right. Okay. What's your first car? The yellow Fiat Punto. Nice one. Uh, Favourite player of all time? Oh, it's so hard to choose. I've been asked this before, and I think I said Beppe Signore, which is a real sort of hipster football Italia <laughs> pick if i was to probably pick anyone it's so weird martin o'connor of birmingham city and Warsaw. i'm a birmingham city fan and in the 90s we were rubbish and he was the sort of heart and soul of our team he was sort of a, a lower league paul Ince, and i loved him right well that, you've just answered the next question favorite team birmingham city what's the most memorable match that you've seen oh So, I'm trying not to have recency bias because I was at England Germany, and that's coming as a as 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 an answer, and obviously all that was pent up in that. 
but I don't know why it's popped to mind. I was at an FA Cup tie between Crawley and South End, which finished 6 2 after extra time mm. <laughs> to uh, to South End. And and that was just madness. Like the last four got four 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 goals all for the away team in extra time. Um yeah, that was that was quite special. Okay. What's been your biggest thrill? In in football or generally? Generally, generally. I really liked when I illegally rented some motorbikes and, and drove around Vietnam because I didn't have a motorbike license mm-hmm. and or, or even a driving license at the time, and that felt quite kind of cool. Mm-hmm. What age were you then? Twenty nine. I, I only learned to drive when I was thirty. Mm-hmm. I grew up in a lot of cities. You didn't um, like, especially in London. You was just like, what was the point? Yeah. I couldn't afford a car. Might as well not spend the money on the lessons. Fair enough. What's been your biggest disappointment? Oh, that's a great question. I think, oh, I think a couple of times in my life, I've sort of, um, sort of given up on projects before, bef- 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 maybe before they were about to come to fruition. And I haven't like stuck stuck them out, and I've gone and taken the e- the easy road. Like a a job offer's come along, and I, I and I've just gone. Oh, I'll just do that instead. Mm-hmm. And looking back, and I, I wish I hadn't. Okay, um, what's the best country that you visited? Oh, oh, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say Peru. I really like Peru. I really like South America. Mm-hmm. But there's something about the sort of. Um, Laid backness of Peru, and yeah, it's just yeah. I, I liked I liked Peru a lot. Okay, was a favourite food pizza. pizza. Absolutely easy pizza every day. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, miscellaneous likes. So give me two things that you like to do. Uh, I like to play really bad village cricket, mm-hmm. uh, and and not good. I, I I like I like being quite terrible at village cricket, <laughs> um, and board games like um strategy sort of board games um things like ticket to ride uh pandemic you know mm. sort of th- those sort of things are those older games or new games? no the the, the, rel- the relatively new um mm. yeah there's just um there's the sort of games where um, pandemic's a cooperative game where you're 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 playing as a team to try and defeat um the game essentially mm. and then ticket to ride is based it's, it's about trains and you can play an american version you can play a european version but you uh the great thing is you don't know who's won until the end so you're all pl- doing your bits of strategy and whatnot you might have an inkling but you only know whether your game has gone badly at, at mm. when you when it's revealed so it keeps everyone interested to the end yeah i, I like that concept i like that so miscellaneous dislikes so a couple of things that drive you up the wall uh, oh, lateness is 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 number one. Like if if you say you're going to be there at a certain time and you're not, you just oh, drives 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 me party. All you have to do is say you're not coming. Or well, that 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 annoys me. The news media reporting on on Twitter as if it's real life because something has been said on Twitter and suddenly it becomes the news. It's mm. just it's just ridiculous. Yeah. So it's things like quoting people off Twitter and news. Yeah, and yeah. It's a particularly radio. Radio are so lazy sometimes. <laughs> so what are we going to do today? Well, let's let's see what's trending on Twitter because we might. You know, it's rubbish. Yeah. Absolutely useless radio. Yep. Go with that. Favorite TV show of all time. Oh, so possibly. Yeah, I'm going to get Parks and Recreation, the American sitcom. Absolutely okay. love it. Okay. I've, I've, it's one of the ones that I've sort of been looking at. I've not watched it, but I've sort of been... So I take it you recommend the f- it? The first season, move past it. You basically have to yeah. move past the first two seasons until they get rid of a character called Mark Brandanowitz. Nothing wrong with the actor. It's just, it's just a very badly written character. And then they bring in some new characters and the sort of ensemble lift, lifts itself. Uh, Nick Offerman's brilliant in it. Amy Poehler's brilliant in it. Uh, Aubrey Plaza um, as April Ludgate steals the show for me. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great show. I would agree with you, uh, uh, James. And it kind of just uh, keeps going. It keeps going and getting. It's, it's, it's as good last season's as, as, as good as it's, its best. And yeah, you're right. The first couple of, certainly that first set of six 
episode first season. It was kind of odd when you rewatch it and you see the the attitudes of the characters towards Leslie just don't just don't fit. Um, yeah, it's a different show. Yeah. But I guess I'd really probably have to watch all from the start just to yeah. Do you know what? Feel Jumping that at the end sort of... of the second season, it, it's it, there is narrative arc to it, but it's funny and it's so it's such such comfortable watching. But it's mm. also it's also it's also it's also got a show that's got a strong moral compass. But yeah. most importantly, the jokes are funny. It's you know, and that's that's why you watch it. Is is it similar to like is it Precinct ninety nine? Is it similar? I don't it's know. Precinct ninety nine. Yeah, I think it's same showrunner, and it's similar to the US Office, and in that same sort of um, that that same sort of world. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, they're yeah. all like that. I, I like them all, but yeah. I'd go for Parks and Rec. Okay, yeah. I'll put that on my list definitely. Okay, favorite singers, so you can have two singers or bands. Uh, Bruce Springsteen, absolutely. I've gone all over Europe watching him, and and I'm just waiting for the chance to go to america to see him he's absolute favorite you know he's, he's a complete throwback he does like four hour concerts mm. it's just it's just mad um i'm struggling to think of a sort of set i'm quite tragic That's <laughs> okay. of, listen then yeah. we can stick with bruce springsteen is that That's um fine. favorite actors so again two if you can <sighs> i like michael sheen and i think um I think that's partly because of his politics and how he's stayed very true to his his roots in Port Talbot. My wife's family are from are from that area, and I know he does he does so much in 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 the local area. And I think he's sort of like versatility as well, particularly as an impressionist. You know, he's done that Chris Tarrant. He's been Tony Blair. He's been Brian Clough. Um, I'm sure he was in was he Frost Nicks? Oh, but, yeah, Kenneth he, Williams. Uh, yeah, he can, Frost. he can just he can just you know he can just become somebody else, and I think I, th- I think that's I think that's an amazing talent. Um, actress wise, um, I think I mean it's too easy to say Kate Winslet because because she's great, but Kate Winslet is great. Um, I'm trying to think. Alison Janney is really good. She, uh, she uh, I think. I first became aware of her as sort of CJ in the West Wing, yeah. um, but she's got a really funny sitcom. I don't think it's been over here a lot called Mom, um, where she, where she's in that, and she, some of her dramatic stuff is, is brilliant. She's in Juno and some other stuff, but yeah, I really like Alice and Jenny. Okay, um, who's your best friend? That's a good question. I'm tempted to say my wife. Because, but then she won't listen to it, so don't worry about it. <laughs> My best friend is, is is a guy called James Lane, and we've been we've been friends since uh, university. And yeah, he lives he lives down in London, and we get together, and we we went to Croatia, England, Croatia together, and England, Germany together. It's yeah. nice, excellent. Who's been the biggest influence on you? So this could be to do with well, anything really. I think that would be my wife, actually. Mm. I think, you know, I think she's uh, been a very positive influence in my life. I was a bit wayward when I was younger, and uh, yeah, she's uh, just she's someone to to aspire to be better for because mm. she's 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 very sweet. She's very uh, wholesome. She's got a bit of an edge to her. She's very she's very successful in her career as well. And um, yeah, I think she's been. We've been together almost twelve years now, so I think she's been a very good influence on me. Okay, that that will get you out of jail, just in case you yeah, well end done. up listening I had to, to it. Do that, didn't I? <laughs> okay, final question: Which person in the world would you most like to meet? Barack Obama, absolutely. I think he's, I think he's, I think he's really brilliant. Mm. Um, potentially at the moment, if I could have a second one, I think Jacinda Ardern. I think she. I've been really impressed with. I mean, I love New Zealand as a country, and if, if it wasn't Peru, I'd have probably picked New Zealand. But what she's been able to do in terms of not just the pandemic, but the terrorist attack in Christchurch as well, uh, they're a tiny country, and she just seems to rise to the occasion, whatever whatever that, whatever that's been. Mm. Um, and I think in a time where we have, in, mo- in a lot of Western countries, had particularly poor leadership, um, you know, forget the politics of it. I just think the 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 lead. You know, a lot of people are following like a zeitgeist rather than saying actually this is this is this is this is what we believe in and the, the, these are our values. And I think she, I think she's. So yeah, either a Barack Obama or Jacinda Ardern. I'd really like to meet. Okay, great answers. Okay, that's the end of that. Tom, I'll pass over to you. 
Yeah, so uh, let's talk a wee bit about your uh, your book, uh, James. Hey. Fix uh, all about the first season of uh, the Champions League. If you could uh, sort of tell us what drew you to the story and how you sort of went about, who you sort of chased after to get interviews with, and, and how how you went about telling the story. It's it's a it's a terrific book. I'm not finishing it. I'm plowing my way through it. Really well researched. Lots of great stuff in it, lots of great anecdotes. Uh, you cover uh, lo- lots of detail over lots of different European teams and, and lots of um, changes in European football, which you, which you cover you cover quite well uh, also. Thank you. That's, that's very kind of you to say so. I got drawn to it initially as the story of Rangers. And I, I remembered like this Rangers thing and I'd watched it on the TV and that was going to be that was going to be the book. And it's been a, an idea that's been in my head for about eight, nine years. And when the pandemic came along, I was just like, okay, if you're going to be furloughed from work and you're just sitting at home and you keep telling yourself one day you're going to write a book, actually, you better write a book. If you're not going to do it now, you're not going to, you're not going to do it ever. So I had that. And then when I looked into it, I was just like, this isn't the story of Rangers. Rangers is what drew me to it. But this is this is the story of of Marseille, Milan. It's the story of Tappy and Berlusconi. But I got really passionate about, I guess, all the teams in it because I was just like, this is this is what the European Cup, this is what European football used to be. There are thirty six national champions in this tournament. They've all won their own leagues. They've all succeeded. They've all got their own story to tell. And I and I wanted to. Uh, I, to make sure that the breadth of that was reflected in there. And obviously I can't go into, you know, as much detail or, you know, talking about, you know, Sconta Riga as, as, as I can Olympic Marseille, but the Sconta Riga story is important. Mm. And, 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 and the, and the same for the Glen Torren story or the, um, now I'm testing my own memory of who, who was <laughs> in it. The IFK Gothenburg story, the, you know, the Viking of not the Viking story that, that, they're all important, and it's it's try it was it was trying to capture you know a bit of I guess what we've lost. Um, you know, in terms of who I went after, you know, obviously tried to get you know the big players from the big team. Sometimes I was successful, so I, you know, Leeds. I spoke to Gordon Strachan uh, and and Gary McAllister, and both were really really generous generous with their time. Um, I spoke to Daniel Amakachi of Club Bruges who actually scored the first Champions League goal and he told me uh, a, a nice little anecdote about how he loved uh, uh, about how he was a, a fan of Scottish football because of reading Shoot and Match magazine when 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 he when he was younger so i think you know that was quite nice but then there's there's other people who you know you just who not necessarily the stars of the book, but say somewhat, somewhat. So for Glenn, for Glenn, for Glenn Torin, I spoke to a guy called Barney Bowers, who pl- who played for that team for f- for fifteen years. He played he played in almost thirty different European matches because they were always in. They were always in, and listening to him, you know, just I, I could have listened to Barney for ages. It was it was absolutely fantastic. You know, hit, you know, almost downloading all his memories. But my favorite, my absolute favorite interview, and I don't want to spoil it too much for you because if you're not at the end of the book yet, was with uh, Jean-Jacques Edelet, who was um, right at the centre of the match fixing scandal. He was the, he was the he was the player who who was found to have gone and bribed the other players from Valenciennes in 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 the league earn match, um, and he doesn't give a lot of interviews, understandably, because people want to just talk to him about the darkest moment of his career. Uh, but we spoke for about an hour uh, and I got him to talk, take me through everything from starting off, uh, from playing from Nantes, moving to Marseille, you know, all through that Champions League campaign because he he starts off on the outside of the team, forces his way in ahead of Bernard Cassini who, um, and Manuel Amaros. Um, Manuel Amaros is a, is a, was the French captain, and he gets ahead of him in in, in the team, and it, it should be a Cinderella story of like a hardworking journeyman player going to the right place at the right time, but because he had a connection to a player who played for Valenciennes, he's the person who's approached to offer the bribe, and then his whole life sort of unravels from there. 
yeah, it, just listening to him and, and all, you know, going through the whole story and how clearly regretful he is about the, the participation in it um, was was very eye opening, and it, it was it was it was a privilege, really. You write a really nice thing about uh, Gerard Tully in the back of the book. Yes, yes, uh, yeah. It was um, G- Gerard was involved in the in in a small way in the formulation of the Champions League. He was part of UEFA's technical committee that advised on 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 the format change. And I was hoping to speak to him about his memories from that and whatnot. And I got in touch with him, and he was he was super positive about meeting. But the pandemic it was pandemic, and he he wanted he wanted to meet in person. He didn't want to do it over Zoom. I don't know if he was a bit technophobic or he ju- he just or just really infused but he wanted to meet uh and we were okay let's meet and then obviously tragically he Mm -hmm. you know not really for me and the book but you know more for his family and and his friends and he he passed away i think in november or december but yeah that was um uh, yeah and i did want to put something in there because um he was you know i suppose you know when you sometimes people sometimes you almost have to cajole people to do an interview with you and you have to convince them and it takes a long time. Gerard Julia, it was one email and it was sort of a ping back within five minutes and he was, he, he was in for it. Um, so yeah. Um, sadly we, we never got to meet and the book is probably a lot poorer for not having his expertise, but um, yeah. It's a terrific read for anybody interested at all in European football and you don't have to remember that campaign at all. It tells you, it tells you a lot about how the competition is as it is now. What's your feelings in the Champions League? Do you like the Champions League now or would you go back to that sort of old European Cup format? It's hard to like the Champions League now. Mm -hmm. And I think what they're going to be doing with the Swiss model, which the whole Super, you know, which was either negotiated in bad faith by the clubs trying to set up the Super League or or, or God knows what, but it's going to make it even more unwatchable. The Champions League from the knockout stages is a fantastic competition. Mm. I cannot remember the last time I sat down and watched a group stage match. Uh, And I think a lot of people are in a similar position. Partly Mm. that's it going to BT and, 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 and being off and being off terrestrial. Uh, But partly it's because the group stage doesn't matter anymore. They've legislated out the underdog. And, yeah. and that and that and that's bad. And I know why the big teams want to do it, and I know why UEFA is complicit in in allowing it to happen because there's money in it for them. But they just they need to think of the bigger picture, and understand that it's okay sometimes if a big team doesn't qualify for the Champions League. It's okay sometimes if a if a you know if a Galatasaray or uh, an Olympiacos or an Ajax get into the knockout stages. We like to see that. Uh, you know, it would be okay if Rangers or Celtic had a chance at doing something in the Champions League once again. And that, uh, but their stakeholders do not want that. They want they want the predictability. And and you know, the, one of the themes of the book is is the development of, of of the Champions League is linked to the you know the you know the clubs trying to grow their income. And why, why I wouldn't necessarily advocate a return to the old European Cup is because it was unarguably an underdeveloped competition. You mm. didn't get the best teams playing each other nearly often enough. I do feel like there's a sweet spot in the late 90s where the Champions League was must-see viewing. Um, and yeah, that's what I'd go back to if I could. Let's go back to 1999. Okay, good stuff. So we will jump back into the magazine page 27 an advert for sports shoes unlimited and we've got um, a nike air jordans in there and england team travel suit which is mostly blue with a large red umbro in the front i'm not quite sure that i remember that too much mm. that one is that uh something you would remember no not not at all but i think i i think sports shoes unlimited are still going and i think i buy from them I I, th- I have ridiculously large feet and I have to get all my shoes online so I think I still use them so it's it's nice to know they're a they're a legacy company. Yeah. So so I I live in England and um, when I first came down I uh, lived in Bradford for like 10 years so I've I've been in this shop that was there um but they have moved from there 
but they are they are still in business, I believe. But um, yeah, I remember going into the shop and it was just like, you know, all this stuff, and you're like, brilliant, brilliant. It's you look at the prices. I mean, it says RRP seventy nine pound ninety nine. Our price fifty nine ninety nine. Yeah, thing, things just aren't cheap anymore, are they? Um, next um, is the page 28. So you can win some tickets for England versus Holland. 15 pairs to be won. And so you phone up, phone the hotline number and answer the question, what was the result when England and Holland last met during the 1990 World Cup finals in Italy? Anybody want to have a stab at that? No, uh, no. No, no, it was, yeah. That was the, the group where... Very, very few goals were scored, wasn't it? Yeah, I think the highlight of that game was uh, Gaza doing a Cruyff turn oh. on the, on Ronald Koeman, I believe. <laughs> okay, so one one set of um, tickets is on its way to you. Okay, moving on, page um, 29 and 30, and uh, quite, um, not 29 and 30, page 30 and 31. So this is two pages that look at Celtic's Rudy Vata. I quite like this little um, article here. Now they talk about his appreciation of what he has in the game. It says, In the days of a £4,000 a week player, it's hard to believe there are any who are still have the hunger to succeed in football. But Shoot has found one man who knows just how fortunate footballers are. Rudy Vata used to earn just £30 a month in his native Albania. Rudy sends money back to his family and says, The situation in Albania is terrible. It makes me very sad. People have very little money and there are bad food shortages. My dad is retired and my mum works in a fab- fabric factory. They scraped and saved to give me a good ed- education. Now I am able to help them. When I played for Dinamo Tirana, I was paid £30 a month, but I was lucky because that was more than many other people and I was also studying physical education. Players in England and Scotland don't know how lucky they are. Now, Rudy is pictured in action for Celtic as he goes up for an aerial challenge with a Dundee player. Now, he isn't happy with the Scottish weather, surprise, surprise, saying, in Glasgow, it's black skies almost every day. I don't think that's the, the weather forecast today, was it, Tom? Blue skies it today? Wasn't, no, it was blue yeah. skies today. Yeah, but he's right, he's right. It's, um, I think it was Billy Conley once said, um, that, I don't know if it was his kid or something, he said, Daddy, why is the sky so low? And that's just the way it feels in Glasgow. You just feel as if the sky's lower than anywhere else in the world. Um, now, Rudy, back to Rudy. He defected after playing for Albania against France and Paris. After the game, he walked out and went to the police and asked for political asylum. And communist rulers back in Albania refused to release his registration from Dinamo Tirana, so he couldn't play for another club. However, when the communists were toppled from power, his opportunities opened up. And he says, my former coach asked me to play for Albania again and picked me for a game against the Irish. It was in this game that he came to the attention of Celtic manager Liam Brady and eventually he managed to beat the red tape and get his move to Celtic for £200,000. I like that. It's, it's, a really, it's a really nice wee story, that. And the fact that um, I think at the time £200,000 was a was a um, record fee for a, for an Albanian player. Um I mean, compared to, you know, earning £30 a month and getting sold for £200,000, that's quite a markup. Yeah. Anything we want to take from that? I, I didn't know anything about this story, mm. and I love it. <laughs> it's uh, it's it's just, it, it, it's it's really of its time, of that sort of collapse of the, of, of, of the Soviet bloc and whatnot. Not that Albania was in the Soviet bloc, mm. but... Albania was such a basket case of a country uh, for, for, for so long. Um, my, when I was researching my book, um, I did a little bit on Albania because I was trying to find out why they were withdrawing from European competition all the time. And it, the, the, the ruler there just seemed to have um, just weird grudges against certain cases. As soon as they were drawn, like if they were drawn against a Swedish team or whatever it was, it was like, okay, we're pulling out type thing. But um, I learned that they've got more military bunkers per square mile than any other country in the world because uh, they were that paranoid about being invaded. So mm. that's 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 the thing I remember. I take away from Albania. Yeah, great, great stuff. But I, like you, I, I just found a, a really um, very interesting story. So well done, Rudy. Um, so moving on to pages thirty-two and thirty-three. Now this is shoot marks or some adverts. Now, if anybody wants to pick anything out please do so but I'm only going to pick out one thing and for me it's this Tenby Soccer Schools advert and I find it quite amusing because at the top of the advert 
in bold uppercase letters it just reads meet Dean Saunders meet Dean Saunders meet Dean Saunders so it looks as though they want people to meet Dean Saunders at their soccer school they're certainly playing on the fact that Dean Saunders will be there which I, I quite like that it's quite quaint uh, absolutely and uh, uh, yeah Tempe lo- a lovely part of the world I could be I thought Dean Saunders was sort of north North Wales but he may he, he must be South Wales mustn't he if he's having it in Tempe mm-hmm. yeah that's uh that's one of those things though you're going to be there for you're going to be there for your seven days and, and Dean Saunders is going to come in right at the end <laughs> hand out some certificates yeah. and sod off isn't he yeah. you're not getting seven days of Dean Saunders no no and they mentioned it again further down so they've got open to youngsters residential course individual and, and close and then meet Dean Saunders so yeah I, I quite I found that quite quite amusing was there anything that anybody saw on any of these two pages not really it's 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 a great bit of nostalgia though there's yeah, there's you know in, in terms of the programs and whatnot it, it made me remember about um play by mail football mm-hmm. i don't know if you've talked about that before but me, me and my dad did that for a while and yeah. i'm sure we found it in the back of one of these yeah yeah that but we have sort of touched on it before but i think i had that play by mail when i was younger it was a it was a space thing like uh uh you know basically you go into space and go around um different stations and stuff like that but there was just so much information at that age i was like overwhelmed by it so i was like you know reams and reams of paper and i'm like i don't know what to do with this i really don't so i think i would have had a better chance with football ones um okay so moving on from the meet dean saunders we're going to move to let's let's just go past that i'm going to move to page 40 so we've got a, f- a photograph of Eric Cantona, um, who's at Man United at this point in France, and he's performing an overhead kick. Uh, I love it because he's absolutely focused on the ball. But there's another there's another photograph in the inset where he's playing for France, and it looks as though he's focused on a different type of ball in in that photograph. Um, it doesn't look the cleverest of challenge. He's go- he's going over the player, and it's the grimace on his face is that sort of grimace that you get where you're not really that interested or that bothered if you. You take the man as well as the ball, are you? No, I mean Cant. I mean Cant. You know, we talked about Ian Wright earlier. Cantona was one of those players who had a horrendous, nasty streak if he wanted to. I mean, to put the Crystal Palace kung fu kick to one side, there's um, he gets banned in France for either three months or six months for literally a waist high challenge. I think you see it in the Fergie documentary, mm. but it's uh, if you haven't seen it, check it out on YouTube. It's just. He, he was just violent. I remember him stamping on John Moncur as well one mm. time. It's like, there's no need. There's no need to do that against Swindon or whoever. They were, you know, yeah. was, he just had that in his game, which he just didn't need to have. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of people excused it simply because of the quality that he could bring when he was playing. So, but yeah, he definitely did have that. Now, I'm just going to point on the right hand side of the photo. Um, you don't see much of it. It looks like the Aston Villa kit, but I'm going to say that Steve Staunton just by that little bit of hair <laughs> so I don't know if anybody wants to argue about that but I'm going with Steve Staunton I mean potentially Stefan Beinlich um, which is a real niche Villa uh, <laughs> pull from, from that time but he's the only other yeah. uh, Villa ginger that I can think of <laughs> Okay so moving on extra time which is some results and scorers, lineups and ratings Again, does anybody pick anything out from any of these pages? Tom, is there any particular results that you want to look at? Uh, under 21, Scotland 1, Iceland 1. Yeah, there was a few names in there that I didn't really recognise um, in the Scotland one. I mean, I don't even yeah, know who Roddy yeah. is that scored. Yeah, Christian Daly's in there. You, you get a record number of Scotland under 21 caps. Mm. I mean, not, not particularly a, a, a game, but just... Just look at the attendances in in in, in Division One. You, you've got you're doing barely mm. any of them are in five figures. Mm-hmm. You've got six thousand at Notts County, four thousand at Grimsby, seven thousand at Tranmere, six thousand at Cambridge. It's just it's a different world. You, yeah. That's just not what you'd get in the Championship nowadays. Yeah, that's a that's a good good spot that I never noticed that but you're right even Division 2 or at the sort of levels that you might get in certain clubs in the Scottish Premier now you know 3-4,000 and things like that um, Burnley Bolton exception 15,000 in Division 2 yeah 
So the, the the one I was going to point out here across the page was there is a photograph and it says Scotland give the Germans a fright. But the reason I'm pointing this out, well, there's a couple of reasons. One, that was the one that Duncan Ferguson done a cracking overhead kick. Mm-hmm. That that just you know it was like uh, Scottish players don't do that. It was it was literally a case of we 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 don't do it. We don't strike balls like that. We don't do overhead kicks against against teams. The keeper saved it, you know. So there's there's a story to that. But the the reason I'm pointing this out is the game isn't mentioned anywhere in the results. And I know this has happened once before in a magazine we looked at Tom, where the, they had a photograph that didn't mention the game, or they 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 had the game twice or something like that. But there's nowhere. And I've looked and looked because I'm thinking is my sight getting really bad. But there's nowhere that mentions it other than that photograph. So they've missed that one out. Okay, I uh, was move on to the back page and we have a photograph of Andy Sinton, Les Ferdinand and Bradley Allen of QPR in a photo collage. And there we go. Who's that in the back there? Steve Staunton of Aston Villa. I'm telling you. That, see, that was the reason that I wanted you to agree with me in the last photograph to set this up because <laughs> you ruined it. But uh, there we go. But yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, um, Bradley Allen, the brother of Clive, I believe, and um, again, I mean, just the strips again. Um, you're spot on about that sponsor. Again, it, it does. The more I see that, it just doesn't look right there. Just make the make it smaller or something like. That. Come up with a, a different um, design than that. Well, put the put the FM to the on the same line as classic. You don't, don't yeah. drop it down to a second line. Yeah. yeah. So the the um. It's, it's probably not interesting, but I'm going to tell you, Nick. <laughs> I was at that game from when that Ferdinand picture is is taken. That's from the opening day of the Premier League season. Mm-hmm, right. And my my uncle took me to Villa Park to try and make me a Villa fan, uh, which obviously <laughs> failed. I don't know why it failed because Villa won four one that day and they were really really good. But mm. Les Les Ferdinand scored a cracking goal, and uh, yeah, that's that's definitely Villa Park on the opening day of the Premier League season. Mm. It's a, it's a it's a nice strip. I quite like that away one. And see, I'm mm. I'm a fan of, you know, Tom Tom was talking earlier on about the away colours mattering to the the club sort of thing. I'm a fan of if at all possible make the away kit the same design as the home kit but just different colours. I I like that idea and the sort of that that's what's going on there. It is, yeah, and the sponsor's one. logo doesn't work any better on the away. No, yeah, no, think. no. As, as James says, I think you know you take the FM, you may maybe make it smaller, and just stick it to the end of classic and have it on the same the same hoop there, and that that would do it. If only if only they knew us. If only we were involved back then. Something <laughs> something else I've just noticed there is um, it looks as though Leslie's um he's folded his his band his shorts band the the band at the top he's folded it over, so maybe he's just finding them a bit too big as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there we go. We've we've got to the end of the magazine. So thank you for staying with us through this. And what what's going on with yourself at the moment, James? What what you what you doing? What you working? Are you working on anything new? I am I am working on uh, a couple of things. One uh, a a rugby related book, looking at the history of the Rugby World Cup, which I think will be will be really nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully, I um I wrote something this week for four four two about the about the statistics behind. Pe- substitutes in penalty shootouts and whether actually it was a uh, mm. good strategy to bring people on right at the right at the last yeah the last, I saw you talking about that on, on Twitter there and uh, there, was, there was a bit of discussion about people saying oh you should give them 10 minutes and well I thought that was just people reacting to the outcome but mm. the data actually backs that up if you come on at the very end of extra time you you the data says only about 40% of those players score score their penalties whereas the standard for penalties is a re- is sort of mid to high 70% and if you come on uh, you know a few minutes before the players tend to score at that stat you know i've uh, you know at set, you know the data i found shows them scoring at 77% so whether it's pressure whether it's they're not warm enough i don't know what it is but there definitely seems to be something in that do not bring a player on just to take a penalty. It put it, it either puts too much pressure on them, or they're not into the game enough to be able to take that. Um, which surprised me, but you know, you got to go where the data get where the data leads you, really, haven't you? Yeah. So, um, you'd, you'd mentioned that that in Euro '96, 
Venables didn't bring any substitutes on, and and historically people have said, oh, but Fowler was on the bench. Why didn't he bring on Fowler? And... Yeah, I, I, absolutely. Uh, I think I think if you lose, you da- you damned whatever way you yeah, go. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah. It, if you win, you're a genius. If you lose, you're an idiot. And uh, you know, Gareth Southgate. You know, I think he's been fantastic. But there's people who are gonna gonna paste him for his substitutions. They're mm. gonna do do you know, it. He can't he he can't win now. Yeah, no, I, th- I think he's, from an outsider's point of view, I think he's done a great job. And obviously a World Cup semi-final and, a, you know, a European Championship finals. Like, you know, so that's amazing. So it's going kind of success, or the almost success, that England fans have been screaming out for for a long time. He's he's the most successful England manager of all time in terms of uh, in terms of major tournament wins and knockout, and knockout wins. So, you know, he's got to be doing something right. And mm. if we... If we go back five years and remember how we felt when we lost to Iceland mm. and then think about that the last five years we were a Daily Telegraph scoop away from having Sam Allardyce in, t- in charge of this really great gr- uh, bunch mm. of young players, I think we should you know, count our blessings every day that we got Gareth Southgate. Mm. Yeah. I, th- I think it's in terms of how the players and the team come across, it's, it's probably as good as I can ever remember. I mean, it's like there's so so likeable players, the managers, all that. So, you know, it's just like they make the right noises, they they say the right things, that they're interested in the right things. Um, and it's... I, I don't ever remember there being a time where they've been as personable to outside of England fans. You know, and it's like... You know, you got to really take your hat off to, to, to every one of them. I think that's right. And I think um, I heard Rio Ferdinand say something in the build-up. He was just like, well, uh, he was like, well, my generation, we, we were interested in all these things and we and we, we wanted to do these things. And so that, but you didn't. <sighs> yeah. You, didn't, you, you guys kept yourself so far away from the fans. You, you know, you, you know, you, looked like you didn't want to be on England duty well whether that's fair or fair fair or not you you looked and gave the impression you cared much more about your club than than country and I think it's just yeah we've had a yeah I think a you know golden generation onwards has been a has has been a has been a fairly negative time to be an England to be an England fan and uh, these guys over the last three three or so years have turned it around and it it, it's it's quite fun Um, obviously Leaving aside some of the unpleasantness of of of, of, of Sunday night and uh, and whatnot, but um, hopefully you know sixteen eighteen months time in Qatar we can we can do something and uh, and hopefully you know you, you got you guys are there as well. I've uh, even even when you haven't qualified for tournaments, you know I, I, you know I think back to France in Euro, Euro twenty sixteen. My favourite fans were still the Scottish fans. Still, you know, he, I love that determination of, of Tartan Army fans. Just well, it doesn't matter that we've not qualified. We're going anyway. <laughs> We're going to have a laugh, yeah. and yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's 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 one of those. And uh, yeah, I, I hope I hope uh, you know it's it's the start of some. You know, I hope it's not just a one-off for you guys. I hope it's the start of something. Yeah, indeed. So, so where where can people buy your book? Yeah, all 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 the all the uh, all all good budge, bookshops and the world's worst website. So you can get it from Amazon or or, or your local bookseller. Um, I, I I I you know go for, go for the local bookseller if you mm-hmm. if, if if you if you can. If you want the convenience, obviously you know Jeff Bezos needs need, needs more money, so help help him out too. Um, and yeah, I'm yeah, so yeah. Or, or if if you if 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 you're not 100 percent sure that you want to buy the book yet and you want to sort of dabble, you can follow it on Twitter at the Fix Book. And as uh, as I'll, I'll tweet little bits and, and nuggets from, from from time to time. Excellent. And where can people follow you yourself on Twitter? At the James Dixon, because I am an egotistical man. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Listen, James, thank you very much again for taking your time to talk to us. It's been really enjoyable, really interesting. So thank you, mate. I I absolutely love this, mm. and I'm, I'm sorry if I talked too long, but just the whole magazine was interesting. Mm. I just I it's just, it's the right time for me. And I think it's a fantastic concept for a podcast. I love it. Brilliant. Thank you. And I'm glad you enjoyed it. And thank you to Tom for being Tom, as usual. Thanks, Andy. And thanks to everyone listening on the podcast. As always, please uh, check out our webpage. There will be an associated webpage with this where we will share 
the the slides or the the, the magazine that we've went through. Uh, you can follow us on shoot the TB underscore podcast on Twitter. Um, our community our charity partner is Western Bartonshire Community Food Share, so you can you can follow them as well. Basically, just go onto Twitter, go onto the website, follow us, share us amongst your friends, get involved, give us some feedback. Until the next time, let's shoot the breeze. The charity partner this season is the Western Bartonshire Community Food Share. This is a charitable organisation that provides various services and support to the local community, including the following. A school uniform bank, school holiday brunch bags, food provisions, Christmas toy bank, cooking and growing lessons and a baby bank. They provide essential support to the local community in supporting individuals and families and we will be looking to support them in any way we can through the podcast. This will include drives for donations of food, money and support in the form of volunteers. We will also be raising awareness of the group to highlight the work that they do, but also to ensure that families and individuals who can benefit from the group are aware of these vital services. You can follow them on the West Dunbartonshire Community Food Share Group on Facebook or West Dunbartonshire Community Food Share dot co dot uk for the website and that's West Dunbartonshire with an N. You can also donate through our Just Giving page for the charity at justgiving.com forward slash fundraising forward slash shoot the breeze one word. Also keep an eye on our Twitter accounts at shoot tb underscore podcast and at Scott's Footy Cards for updates and news on our charity partner. We'd like to say a special thank you to Pete Wiley of the Mighty Wah for the use of the story of the blues in the music for our show. You can catch up with Pete on petewiley.co.uk where you can check out the details of upcoming gigs and new music. We'd also like to thank our producer Diane Jarden for her great work and support on the podcast. Please check out transmissionroom.co.uk where you can book music recording and rehearsal facilities in Clybank.